Alessandro and his longest interview ever. Luis Alessandro is a former U.S. Army counterintelligence special agent, mostly known as the director of the now defunct ATIP, a program initiated by the Defense Intelligence Agency in order to study unidentified aerial phenomenon, also known as UFOs. Thank you to Shortform for sponsoring this video, and click on the timestamp in the description if you'd like to skip this intro. For those new to this channel, my name is Kurt Jaimungle, and I'm a filmmaker with a background in mathematical physics dedicated to the explication of what are called theories of everything from a theoretical physics perspective, but also delineating the possible connection consciousness may have to the fundamental laws, provided these laws exist at all and are knowable to us. Now this UFO phenomenon may seem tangential to the exploring of the variegated landscape of toes, that is theories of everything, however if you watch episodes like the Kevin Knuth episode, you'd see that there's an intimate connection between some of the deep mysteries of the universe and this phenomenon. Thus I'm interested, and don't view this enigma with the stigma that the majority of the scientific community has. If you enjoy witnessing and engaging in real-time conversation on the topics of consciousness, psychology, physics, and so on, then do click on the link in the description for the Discord and for the subreddit. There's also a link to the Patreon, that is patreon.com slash Mungle, if you'd like to support this podcast as the sponsors and the patrons are the only reason I'm able to do this full time and it would be extremely difficult to explore topics like geometric unity or loop quantum gravity or even string theory which is coming up without the sponsors without being able to do this full time because of patrons like yourself. Again that link is patreon.com slash Kurt Jaimungle. Thank you regardless of your decision. As for the sponsors, there are three. Algo is an end-to-end -end supply chain optimization software company with software that helps business users optimize sales and operations planning to avoid stockouts, reduce returns and inventory write-downs while reducing inventory investment. It's a supply chain AI that drives smart ROI, headed by a bright individual named Amjad Hussein, who's been a huge supporter of the Toe podcast since nearly its inception. In fact, Amjad has a podcast about AI and consciousness, which will be linked in the description, so if you'd like to learn more about that, then you can subscribe to his content, as doing so supports this content. The second sponsor is Brilliant. Now, Brilliant illuminates the soul of math, science, and engineering through these bite-sized interactive learning experiences with courses that explore the laws that shape our world, the fundamental laws which elevate math and science from something to be feared to this delightful experience of guided discovery. You can even learn group theory, which is one of the most daunting mathematical theories, at least for newcomers, and it's one of the main pillars behind the standard model, that is quantum field theory. So when you hear that the standard model is predicated on SU2 cross SU3 cross U1, that's the same as, well, those are technically called Lie groups. Visit brilliant.org slash toe for free and get 20% off the annual subscription. I recommend that you don't stop before four lessons, and I think you'll be greatly surprised at the ease at which you can now grok subjects that you previously had a hugely difficult time understanding. The third sponsor is joining us for the first time, and that's short form which is a place that you can go if you don't have the time or the inclination to read an entire book. Yet, let's say you want to know the gist of it so that you can be conversant as if you've read it. And I mean that in the best sense, more on short form later. Quick note, this podcast is also on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and so on. I hear many comments asking where it is. It's in the description if you'd like to follow on an alternate audio platform. Thank you, and enjoy this conversation, one of the most revelatory conversations with Luis Alessandro to date. That's primarily thanks to you, as this was an AMA, that is, questions were gleaned from you. Thank you for watching slash listening, and thank you, Lou, for your generosity. Enjoy. Jennifer's Tell tie. Jennifer, like, I know how much my wife contributes to my success. It's mainly my wife's success, so I imagine much of your success absolutely is your wife's success. Absolutely correct. Kurt, it is. It is. Absolutely. It is. It is, um, you know, behind, I tell everybody, behind every great man is a greater woman. Uh uh, or a greater person, you know, right. I mean, obviously it might come from an older generation, but it, you know, it, it's, it's usually the success of anybody is always dependent upon a close circle of, of trusted people behind them, um, uh, that are, that are, you know, really helping make things happen. So you're, you're absolutely right. Okay. Anything you want me to be aware of before we go live? Anything you want to say? You know, the rules, man, there are no rules. You know, you can ask me whatever you want. Okay. If you can see this type, forgot about Dre. Forgot about Dre. So Lou, while I'm making sure, there's about a 20 second delay before I can tell if this actually went live. How's your day going? Uh, you know, it's going, 
uh, considerably well uh, versus the alternative, right? There's an old saying, any day above ground is a good day. And uh, I, I definitely subscribe to that. I know that you're in such a whirlwind. Primarily, what is it? Interviews or what? Uh, no, I wish. Um, it's a combination of many things. You know, when I when I first presented that those five slides, um, those on, on how we are having this conversation, legislative engagement, executive engagement, et cetera. Um, all those take a lot of effort every day, a lot of care and feeding. They're like, they're like children really uh, that are constantly uh, wanting attention. And so you, you have to, to feed the beast accordingly. You have to make sure you give just the right amount of information um, to, to, to those specific silos, if you will, or, or pillars, um, you know, to, to keep them happy. Um, but of course, therein lies part of the challenge because you can't give all sides the same information necessarily, because obviously the information you talk to with executive leadership sometimes is classified and you can't give that necessarily to the public, but you can still have the same conversation without providing classified information. And so that's, you know, that's how you have to thread that needle. And it's a, it's a constant, uh, it, I guess you could call it spinning of plates. Um, and hopefully you don't drop, drop any of them. And so it, it takes a lot of, a lot of time, uh, it takes a lot of effort um, and a lot of, a lot of coordination for each one of those. This is what I don't think people understand when you look at the, the collective achievements or accomplishments we collectively have made mm -hmm. all of us over the last four years, each one of those bullets is, 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 hundreds, if not sometimes a thousand hours working behind the scenes to make things happen. Um, it's, 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 it's a lot, a lot of work and, you know, I still have a day job and, uh, I'm still, you know, trying to, to do my best to have this conversation, you know, every time I have one of these, these interviews, um, and you can attest to this, Kurt, you know, I don't get paid for this, you know, you're not, yeah, I mean, I don't call me a liar, but are, have, have you ever paid me to do an interview? No. No, right, and I don't ask for one, and I won't accept it um, for to do one uh, like like this. And so, um, it takes time away from my other stuff. It's uh, it's a lot, a lot of work, but I think it's worth it in the end. I think ultimately, this is a conversation that that needs to be had, and I think we we all we all have a part of it. Do these conversations make you nervous? Uh, you know, conversation doesn't make me nervous. People make me nervous. Um, it's probably just a product of my, my upbringing and maybe my, my, my choice of, of career profession. Um, I think dialogue and, and conversation is great. You know, it's, it's funny. You should ask me that, Kurt, because there's a, um, my wife and I, my wife jokes quite a bit with me and, and she, she sometimes don't know if I'm telling, if I'm being serious or not, uh, just because of my sense of humor. And, um, you know, I told her, I, I said, after, after, 40 or 50 years around the sun, the one thing I've learned, it's, um, you know, I, I love humanity. It's, it's humans. I don't like, you know, mm. and, uh, there's a difference, you know, I, I love the idea of humanity, but unfortunately, uh, it, it, individually as human beings, um, you know, there's uh, I think there's a lot of room for improvement for, for all of us, to be honest with you. And so, so there lies the problem, um, to have a conversation that's, Concerning, uh, you know, humanity, I, I have to engage, you know, humans, um, and and that's what that's what I find challenging sometimes because humans are uh, we're emotional beings. Uh, we can be we can be fragile beings, and sometimes we can be um, we can be violent beings and 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 uh, to each other, and that violence can manifest itself not just physically, but sometimes just in words and hatred and. So uh, I, that's what I find so challenging, you know, sim just simply trying to have a conversation and there's people out there that want to want to stifle that conversation for, for whatever reason. Okay, well, let's minimize your trepidation by saying anytime you need to refill your coffee or go to the washroom, people who are watching, just bear with us because we're going on for quite some time. So here's a question from myself. By the way, Is I have there... to ask, what do you think of my coffee cup, right? I, I know people are expecting like machine guns and tanks and whatnot, right? But I have flowers to celebrate fall, right? I have hearts. There you go. Oh, you beat me. Okay. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> Damn you, Kurt. <laughs> conspicuous for similar reasons. Okay. Is there any evidence that these, whatever we want to call them, aliens, creatures, future humans, whatever we want, let's label them X. Is there any evidence that these X K 
can shapeshift, can look like other humans or other creatures? You know, I I, I don't know. Um, but I'll tell you, mimicry is, is something that is common in nature, and it's even common in what we do. Um, there are species to, to defend themselves in the animal kingdom. Let's take a coral snake versus, let's say, a king snake. Um, the coral snake is very deadly. The king snake um, has the same colors, except for some of the, 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 the color arrangements are in opposite order. Um, and, and these animals mimic other animals for protection. Now, let's look at it from a humanistic perspective. Um, we have something uh, where we call light deception on, for example, Navy ships. In the old days, we would string lights in a way that would try at night to make a uh, big, large destroyer appear to be a, uh, a fishing boat, right? A trawler. Uh, and and we, we light deception is, is part of camouflage, part of survival. So um, if there is a, a species that is, is far more advanced than, than human beings, um, it's not inconceivable. Look, we can go to the panda exhibit in, in, in you know, the zoo in China and see that zookeepers will often wear these kind of, I mean, it appears ridiculous to us, but not so ridiculous to the pandas. Um, the zookeepers are, are required to wear a panda suit, a big furry uh, teddy bear suit. Um, Interesting. As, yeah, they do that. So when they go into the enclosure to clean up the enclosure or whatnot, provide food, um, they don't disrupt the, the local panda population as mm -hmm. least as possible. Um, you know, of course, it's, it's entertaining to us to see a bunch of humans walking around in furry mm -hmm. panda suits, but... But at the end of the day, it's it's effective. So, um, you know, I, I I don't think it's inconceivable. Um, I, you know, the problem is when we start going down the road of you know we say shape shifting and things like that. Immediately, we start going into the world of woo, quote unquote, and and paranormal. And again, there's nothing wrong with it. I've I've written articles on on paranormal, right? Everything by 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 definition in science is paranormal until it becomes normal, uh, frankly. So, but the problem is that we we don't have hard evidence. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence. Um, a lot of, a lot of people report seeing things uh, that these, the UAP can look like an aircraft sometimes disguise itself like a 747 or, or that the, uh, the occupants can, can, you know, make themselves look like human beings. Um, I, I don't really know. Um, during our time at ATIP, we were focused uh, primarily on the nuts and bolts of this. And, uh, you know, what, what our military uh, eyewitnesses and, and collection capabilities were telling us. Um, at the time, we didn't really have any reports of, quote, unquote, um, shape-shifting. Now, cloaking, that's a different story. Um, we do have some information that indicates that these things do have an ability uh, to try to evade some of our, our sensor um, and, and, for example, radar. Um, you get these nonsensical, what looks like spoofing. Uh, or radar jamming occurring. Um, you have, uh, you know, the low observability portion of the five observables is, is you know, that includes things like active camouflage and cloaking and, 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 and again, low observability. It's, it's hard to see. Um, and so that there is, there is information that we have that, that pertains to that. Okay, speaking about cloaking, is there any evidence that suggests, well, UFOs are associated with orbs, at least anecdotally? Firstly, what's the reason for that? And then second, is there any evidence that you know that suggests that these orbs may be more plentiful than we think, perhaps around us, whether in homes or outside cityscapes, just cloaked? Yeah, the problem with orb, the word orb is, is you're not going to get a common definition from most people. Everybody thinks an orb means something else. Some people think an orb is a little plasma ball. Others say it's much, much bigger and intelligently controlled. Um, you know, orb is kind of a general catch-all. When you say is an orb related to UFO, well, by definition, it is a UFO. It's unidentified and it's flying or it's, a, you know, it's in our atmosphere and uh, it's an object or something. We don't know what it is. So by definition, an orb is a UAP, but the question is, is it a UAP in the sense that we, we, we're talking about UAPs, whether lenticular type shape or, or maybe a, a cylindrical shape or a triangular vehicle? Um, I think the jury's still out. There does seem to be some information that suggests that orbs, uh, as you call them, are sometimes associated with other UAP sightings, that there are UAPs in the sky, and then you see these little balls of light. You know, um, the problem is it's, it's, it's a very generalized term. Um, we now know for a fact that things such as ball lightning are real. Is that an orb? Well, yeah, times it looks, looks like an orb to me. 
Um, other times when you have large, um, large amounts of energy being released into, into the atmosphere and the environment, let's talk about let tectonic movement, for example, where these titanic forces uh, right underneath the surface of the earth, um, creating this, 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 this plasma effect in the atmosphere where you get these different colors uh, shooting into the sky and, and, and again, orbs, if you will, um, being reported and seen and even captured on camera. Uh, but that that's that's an orb that that I think we can all agree is probably um, being manufactured um, naturally. Now, are there orbs that are intelligently controlled? Well, we did talk about that at ATIP. You know, one of the questions were when you look at the the the, the different shapes and, and sizes of vehicles, orbs tend to be almost like a, I guess in 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 a vernacular sense. Think of a, a UAV. Um, think of a, a drone. Um, the, 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 they tend to be described as being much smaller, highly maneuverable, uh, different colors, sometimes red, sometimes green, sometimes yellow, sometimes blue. Um, is it possible that those colors are, are, are indicative of mission set, right? Is it, mm. it, are the blue ones doing certain things where the reds are doing something else and their purpose is something else where the yellows and whites are doing something else? Um, it's certainly plausible. Um, you know, I, I, I don't dismiss that at all. Um, the problem is we just don't have enough information because it appears that the, the, the these orbs tend to be small that it's really hard to argue the case that they are being occupied by any type of, of biological organism. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not. It just means that, you know, it, we haven't seen that yet. Um, you know, we, we don't know what these are. Are these perhaps some sort of unmanned reconnaissance uh, capability that are kicked out Um not much different than we use drones ourselves, right? To do certain types of reconnaissance missions. Um, we don't know. It's certainly possible. The reasoning behind my question is that Tom DeLong, I recall, was saying one shouldn't do CE5. I'm going to get you to explain what CE5 is. But anyway, one shouldn't do CE5. And when one does it, often orbs are associated with it. And one thinks, oh, that's great because I'm inducing some contact. And Tom said, be careful. One shouldn't do that lightly. So... That to me implies that there's something nefarious or potentially nefarious about these orbs. Well, I mean, look, I'd say the same thing. You know, don't mess around with electricity unless you're a licensed electrician. Be careful because you can get zapped. That's true with anything. That's not just orbs. That's electricity. That's swimming pools. That's everything. Um, you know, just uh, it, I can't speak for Tom. You know, I, I don't know what Tom meant by that. But I can tell you that that general word of caution, I think, is 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 appropriate for for just about anything out there. You know, if you don't know what you're getting into, just just be mindful. Um, you know, there are potentially things that go bump in the night, and 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 it's not all you know um, necessarily uh, good or bad. You know, it's um, not all sunflowers like your cup. Well, you know, anytime you go go snorkeling, look, I'm I'm an avid scuba diver. Um, been scuba diving my my whole life. Um, you know, there's always a, a remote risk when you go scuba diving in some of these beautiful coral reefs. You know what? There's a risk you're going to come up against a shark. Now, not all sharks are going to do anything, but if you're carrying a, you know, a bag of 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 fresh fish that you wound up spearing uh, and and are now bleeding out of this bag and and, and dead. Um, chances are you may attract a lot more attention than just a curious shark. You may be attracting a hungry shark and now you got to kind of pay attention. So, um, you know, I, 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 I think that's wise advice on just about everything that we, 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 uh, we do, you know, I, I live here in Wyoming where a lot of people like to go, go splunking and, 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 you know, adventuring into caves, but again, you know, you have to have the right equipment. Be careful when you go into a cave, you know, make sure right. you've got light, make sure you've got, you know, gear that can get you in and out and rope and whatnot. Okay. Now let's get to some of the audience questions. This one comes from Stephanie, Stephanie Highfill. Is there information being recorded or being encoded into less mainstream information media channels that can be free, that can be parsed out John Nash style, like a beautiful mind that could help us arrive closer at the truth of this phenomenon? So I'm going to need your help, Kurt, kind of detangling that question because I'm not familiar with the reference. But when you're saying encoded, um, can can you repeat that question one more time? I want to answer it. And I just want to make sure I, I'm understanding the question. Okay, just deciphering. Essentially, with someone of sufficient intelligence can decipher that there are different drops being placed by, let's say, disclosure people, the government. 
Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Breadcrumbs. What yeah, I refer to as breadcrumbs. Right, and that one can decipher it. Um, well, you know, I, I've I've always left breadcrumbs. Every interview I ever do, uh, for the last four years, um, you know, I think people can now go back through a lot of what I've said in the past and come back and say, oh, <laughs> so that's what he was referring to. Now we know uh, because certain people have come out, whether it's, you know, Jim Likatsky in his book or other folks. Um, you know, I, I, I think... I can't speak on behalf of the government and of the other people. Um, I suspect that um, what, what I can say is I, I think that we are at a point now where um, we don't have to leave the breadcrumbs um, that, that we have been in the past. I, I think, I think the time has come for us to be even a little bit more straightforward and a little bit more clear. Um, you know uh, the difficult part is when you're dealing with security clearances and NDAs, which everybody hates to hear. You know that's that's becoming a, a three-letter word um, that I think is is <laughs> probably going to be etched somewhere on my on my tombstone, and people are going to be throwing tomatoes at it. You know uh, from here to eternity because they hate it and they don't they don't but they hate it because they don't really understand what it means and and, and why you have them. Um, you know, those, those NDAs definitely get in the way of having a complete transparent conversation. But I, I also think that, that we are having it. I think we're, we, we're, we've come a long, long ways. And as far as answering this specific question, as far as leaving breadcrumbs, I can't speak for anybody else. I, I don't know precisely what the government, because the government isn't just this one huge, uh, if you will, monolithic enterprise. It, it's, it's comprised of people and, and those people, each of those people have their own interests and their own desires and, and their own agendas. And so I, I, I can't speak for them. I can only speak for me. Um, I think certainly if people were to look at all the this talks I've given uh, and, and really look at them and listen to them closely, they will see that a, a lot more has been said than, uh, than, than might necessarily be acknowledged. Okay, this one comes from Ross Coltart. Since you left the DOD, have you been warned not to talk publicly about certain things? And if so, what? Yes, I have been warned. Uh, I've been warned, first of all, not to discuss, cla not to discuss classified information, um, which I have heeded uh, thus far and will continue to do so. Um, I've had, uh, I've had, I've been threatened. There were individuals in, in the Pentagon that did not like what I do and how I did it. And so uh, once Secretary Mattis's um, public affairs officer, Dana White, left, they started to change uh, the narrative a little bit. Um, I was told that I would be labeled crazy uh, and that they would come after my security clearance, which they did. They actually did uh, try to do that. Um, and uh, they were they were true to their word, <laughs> but um, fortunately, I had some 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 friends and allies that knew exactly what I was doing beforehand, and uh, you know it uh, it wasn't quite so easy for them to to be able to do that. But but to put it simply, yeah, I, I've I've been warned. So you've been warned. Have you ever gotten in trouble? Ross has a sub question. Have you gotten into trouble for acknowledging that the U.S. has recovered non-terrestrial materials? Well, they're watching me very closely. Um, they're, they're trying, there's elements that are trying to get me into trouble. Um, so that's why I walk a very fine line. I walk right up to that line, but I won't step over it um, because they're waiting for me to screw up. They're waiting, me for to say, they're waiting for me to say one word that I shouldn't say uh, and in order to use that against me and silence me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have gotten in trouble. They tried to come after my clearance, like I said, um, you know, and unfortunately I had to, I had to seek legal counsel uh, to protect my constitutional rights to do so. Um, you know, it seems that they've backed off a little bit for now, uh, but I'm not fooling myself. I, I know that there's there's still you know wolves circling uh, just beyond the the limit of 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 the fire that I'm I'm standing next to, uh, waiting for an opportunity. So I'm very mindful of that. But you know, I will also say that there's some really good elements. I've had an opportunity. You know, sometimes through the worst of adver uh, adversity, you get a chance to see people at their best. And I've learned that there are people on the inside that really do want to have a conversation and that want to see things done right. And these are senior people. Some of these are very, very, very senior people. And uh, they have, they were willing to put their, their professional careers on the line to defend me and protect me. Um, and, you know, that, 
that means a lot. That makes, that makes me feel, makes me feel good uh, because I've always been that way. You know, I've, I've could have called people out by name three, four years ago, just to defend my credibility. And I never did. Um, you know, people are now realizing that a lot of those people are now finally coming out of the shadows and, you know, my life could have been a lot easier had I, had I, had I, you know, called them out um, to defend me, but I didn't because I made a promise to them that I would never, I would never reveal their identities until they were ready to do so. Um, and, uh, that's just the way I am. I mean, to me, principles, you know, mean everything, either, either you're a person of principle or you're not, um, doesn't matter how bad the, the, the going gets you, you, you know, you got to stick by your word. So it's been a mixed bag for me. Um, you know, make sure Ross, we tell Ross here, the, 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 the full story that in, you know, even though I've, I've had people coming after me, I've also had a lot of people rally around me. And, and to me, I'd rather, f- I focus on those folks. Uh, those are the folks that I, you know, it just makes you want to do this even more because, you know, they're, they're willing to, to get your back. And are you allowed to say those folks' names? Uh, well, they haven't come out of the shadows yet. They're, they, they, they're in the process. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll let that play out. Uh, but I think it'll be quite obvious when they step out because people are going to go, oh, that person? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I didn't know that person was with Lou. Um, you know, so I'll leave it at that. An- another bread, another breadcrumb, right? <laughs> right, right. There are many people who have super chatted. Don't worry, I'm going to get to them. I have a follow up question to what you just said, which is there are wolves that are watching you like a hawk. Is there another reason outside of national security that they they don't want you to disclose what you may disclose, or they're worried you may? Yeah, I mean, what is their worry outside of them? There have been. Um, you know, uh, forbidden truths, we can call them, if you will. There have been forbidden truth in the history of not just our country, but many countries. Uh, truths that could upset a balance, a balance that's been around for a long time. Um, let me give you case in point. Um, let's say there were some people that were doing their job by running a, a UFO program in the past, uh, but because certain things happened, um, presidents were no longer briefed, people in Congress were no longer briefed who should have been, and now they're running an operation that's um, uh, considered rogue, but it's still an important mission. Um, it turns out, you know, all of a sudden now, let's say hypothetically, the cat's out of the bag. What's going to happen to those people when, when the government realizes they were running operations, for better or for worse, um, without any oversight, without any legal oversight, right? What, what, who, who's going to be held accountable for that? The fact that they did not brief legally like they were supposed to. <clears throat> Certain members of Congress and committees and oversight committees and, and, and the chain of command, um, that's, that's potentially criminal, criminal action. Let's say, I, I've said this before, let's say you have two competing companies. You have uh, aerospace company A and aerospace company B. And aerospace company A, for whatever reason, gets a favor and some sort of really exotic game-changing material is provided to that company to do an analysis. Meanwhile, company B, who is competing fairly, um, doesn't, uh, doesn't get that material. Turns out company A now starts getting a lot of contracts, defense contracts, and becomes a multi-billion dollar company. While company B, who never had the advantage of having that material, um, goes into bankruptcy people, hundreds of people lose their jobs and stockholders lose their, their, their investment. Um, keeping in mind that both companies are supposed to be treated fairly and have fair comp- competition uh, when it comes to U S government contracts. Now what, now, now what happens? Where's the liability? And by the way, now these companies are, are, you know, doing good things for the United States. Um, but they got there because they had an unfair advantage, competitive advantage. Uh, potentially again, I'm not, I'm not, uh, this is hypo- hypothetical, right? Where's the liability there. You're talking to trillions and trillions of dollars worth of liability. Um, you know, and, and who made those decisions to do that? You know, who's going to be held culpable for that? Uh, you know, security exchange commission would not be very happy to know that, that two publicly company, two publicly traded companies that were competing for a contract. One had an unfair advantage. The other went bankrupt. That's that that that's a problem. That's a real problem. And so, you're talking about big, big money interests. You're talking about things that are going into that gray world that go beyond just government interests. You're talking about banking. You're talking about um, 
you know, some, some of the biggest names on the planet that have a lot to lose uh, or a lot to gain in hindsight. So, you know, I think we always have to be careful that, that governments have always had um, interesting ties to, to, to certain interests. And that's true of all governments. That's not just the U.S. That's, that's everybody. Um, and we need to be mindful of that, you know, because you, you could be, you could be um, putting some people in a very uncomfortable position. And I'm aware of that. And that's why I've been very delicate how I approach this topic. I'm not trying to beat anybody up. I'm not trying to expose anybody and, and, and say, ah, ha, ha, gotcha. See there. Um, I'm trying to have the conversation in a collaborative, meaningful way where, where everybody wins. Nobody has to get burned, right? It's not a zero sum game. I'm not hypothetically, do they view it like that? Like there's a potential where everyone can win or do they view it somewhat zero? Well, I can't, I can't speak for them. I can't tell you what they think. All I can tell you is what I think and, and, and my approach and my approach is to say, look, guys, you know, we're not trying to expose anybody. This is not, I'm not trying, it's not a witch hunt, you know, despite what you may see on social media where everybody wants their pound of flesh. Um, that's not going to get us anywhere. We, we need to, to, we need to be adults about this and we need to have a, a conversation that if you, if you really want the truth to come out, you better be able, you better be willing to compromise. You know, this is, we're not going to, we're not going to sit there and put people to be eaten by the lions um, just to, just to satisfy someone's, you know, ego or, 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 or beef that they might have with somebody else. Um, you know, the truth is more important than that. This is not about, uh, see, I told you so, or, or, or being vindicated. This, this is about having a conversation that's, that, that can affect all of humanity. And, and we have to be willing to, to set aside some of that, uh, if you will, um, and understandably so, you know, you've got lots and lots of decades worth of, of people covering this up. I know there's a lot of animosity and resentment as a result of that by people saying, you know, you've been lying to us for all this time, but, but we got to be willing to put that aside if we really want to move forward, in my opinion. You're referring to animosity from the general public or animosity from some of these wolves? No, no, general reference? public who, who, who want their pound of flesh because people have been covering this topic up for too long, knowing that it's real been lying to the American people. Potentially, I mean, how I, long I is too long? When you, potentially, is it centuries? Is it decades? Well, you know, there's information that goes. Well, I live here in Wyoming, and I live next to uh, members of the Crow Nation. Um, and if you've ever had a chance to to talk and really engage with Indigenous people, first of all, they're very very private. Um, two, um, they have an incredibly rich history. Their 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 oral oral traditions and, and oral history doesn't go back a few hundred years. Um, it goes back millennia. In fact, when when Europe was facing its dark ages and 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 mankind almost went extinct in the European continent, and we were burning books, um, you know, indigenous people over here were experiencing a golden era. Um, that wasn't the case over here. And the way they look at nature, the way they look at um, this topic, UAP, is not like we look at it through Western eyes. Um, in fact, they don't view it as a threat at all. In fact, they don't view it even as paranormal. They, they view it as, as normal, as part of, the, of, of nature, uh, their natural environment, as real as the, the lakes and the sky and the trees on the mountains are. Um, and it's just accepted as part of, part of the greater universe. And, you know, I, th I think there's some beauty there. Um, you know, they're not held hostage by their, by their fears. Um, in fact, they, they embrace it. Yeah. And, and that goes to show that, that, you know, you don't have to view this topic as an either, or it doesn't have to be viewed as a threat or as, uh, you know, um, some sort of, of, um, saving, uh, opportunity for our species. Um, it could just be a natural part of our existence. Um, again, do I subscribe to that? I don't know, but I certainly, I, I certainly think it's another way, another perspective that we should consider. Um, if that is the case and, and they're right, then we've been dealing with this for millennia. I can tell you that um, having a chance to talk to some people in the Vatican, you know, they describe these, these flaming Roman shields in the sky that would follow them from, from battlefield to battlefield, what they call the eclipus, which is the shape of the Roman shield. 
Um, you know, that's documented. That's there. In fact, I think if I'm not mistaken, I, I haven't read it from Jacques Vallée, uh, but from my understanding, Jacques Vallée even wrote a little bit about that. Um, but I've, I've seen that evidence myself. There, there is, there is documentation of these strange things in the sky going back a long, long time. So I don't think it's necessarily modern, um, Maybe our understanding is is a little bit more advanced and maybe consider that modern, but I don't think we're dealing with a new phenomenon. I think we may be dealing with a new recognition uh, and perhaps hopefully at some point a new understanding, but I don't think this is a new phenomenon to mankind. I think we've been faced with this phenomenon for quite some time. You mentioned millennia, which is thousands of years. I'm wondering potentially tens of thousands, potentially millions, or do you think it's cut off around 9,000 or so? Well, that's that's hard to tell because we only as a species, Homo sapiens sapien, have been around roughly for 100,000 years. And we only really gotten into written language in the last five, 6,000 years, really. Um, and been gone from, you know, uh, hunter gatherers to more of an agrarian type society, organized society, which is if you take 100,000 years and you compare the last 5,000 years, really only the five, 5% five of our entire time rummaging around on this planet has been in somewhat of a civilized fashion. Um, you know, and then if you look at that to the context of it's been, you know, only in the last, you know, thousand years, 2000 years, we, we understood, you know, the Archimedes steam engine, right. And really didn't even fully appreciate it until the industrial revolution just a couple hundred years ago. So now you're talking at, you know, 0.2% of mankind's time on earth. Um, we, we've been industrialized, we've been civilized. So how much of our own history do we really know? Well, you know, we can go back 5,000 years pretty easily. Um, 8,000 years, things start to get a little murky, right? And anything much beyond that, uh, we really have no clue about. And the question is, have we as a species been aware of this, phenomenon much longer. Well, let's look at what we do know. Um, you know, the, the general consensus is that the 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 American population, let's say American, I mean United States, I mean North America, South America, Central American population, really began about 20,000 years ago with uh, during the land bridge when you had a migration coming over the land bridge and, and settling this part of the planet. But in reality, it turns out now that a lot of scientists believe that there were many migrations and many migrations before that primary migration 20,000 years ago. In fact, there may have been multiple migrations going back, perhaps even 100,000 years ago. So um, is it possible that, that our, our society um, was aware of these things, maybe even interacted with these things in a certain fashion? I'm sure it's possible. Absolutely, it's possible. I mean, most of our history, we have no idea about. You know, it's, it's like... it's. It's like spending an entire day and having amnesia, except for the last five minutes before you go to bed. You know, right. where the hell was I? What was I doing? What did I eat? Who did I speak to? What, what did I say? What I'm wondering is what you're referencing is written history. And I'm curious about archaeological evidence that you're aware ah, of. So or that potentially you, exists. It's interesting. Yeah. So let me give you a real world example. And I'm not going to either defute, uh, refute or, or defend it. But again, I live here in Wyoming um, and there is a, a legend here called the little people, the Paiori mountains. Um, and for generations, the, the indigenous people have reported uh, what appear to be this fearsome pygmy warrior tribe of humanoid type creatures that lived in the mountains. And for many, many, many years, it was completely um, considered a myth. myth. Uh, folklore, just, right? Yeah. Folklore. And it turns out that scientists began uncovering um, artifacts up in the mountains that, uh, to some degree, reinforced the notion that there was some sort of uh, small hominoid type creature uh, living in the mountains. Um, they found uh, small tools. They found, you know, small bones um, that appeared to be 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 coming from some, you know, human 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 like creature. Now, I, I don't know. I don't know the details uh, thoroughly. I haven't had a chance to really, really explore it or, or study it. But that part is true, um, that that people are now beginning to look back and say, well, wait a minute. Um, is that possible? Because we're starting to find archaeological evidence. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. Here, I, I can walk up into the Bighorn Mountains, and they're pulling out spearheads, spearheads uh, that are 11,000 years old. Now think about that for a minute, 11,000 years old. 
if that spearhead could talk, what people did it come from? What were they hunting? What did this place look like? You know, environments change in a blink of an eye. Look at the Sahara Desert in 5,000 years. You know, there was a lot of wildlife living in the Sahara region uh, before it became a desert. And, and that was in recent human history, by the way. We were inhabiting the planet when that happened. There are, are drawings on the side of rock walls that illustrate uh, um, all alligators, uh, crocodiles, if you will, and, and, and animals that live not just on the savanna, but in the wetlands, um, all cohabitating there. So, so this earth is very dynamic. Um, every time we have a, you know, for us, it seems like a long time, but every time we have an ice age, every roughly 10, 15,000 years, the entire topography of, of earth changes, the climate changes, animals change, people change. Right. Um, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's very possible that, that there is potentially some sort of archeological evidence. The question is, would we recognize it if we saw it? And that's another big, big question we have to ask ourselves. You know, um, let me ask you this as a scientist, Kurt, if I said to you, um, Kurt, you have a task. Um, you can make it out of whatever you want, any material you want. Your goal is to, in a million years, you have to create something now that will last a million years to prove you were here. What would you do? How would you do it? Think about it. Go ahead. No, 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 no. Let's do, let's, let's, I, I love you, man, but we're going to, we're going to have this mental exercise right now. I think it's important. And by the way, it's not a trick question and I'm, I'm not playing gotcha. Just, but would you give me just some examples that you might throw out there to say, okay, I'm, I would make something out of this or out of that. Or... There are some meta materials that seem to be harder than diamond. So whatever is our hardest material, it would be made out of that. Also, just so you know, I don't classify myself as a scientist. I I'm more of a hobbyist, let's say. So that's what I would do. Fair. So you'd find some sort of hard material that would outlast just about anything else on earth, right? Where would you put right. that material? Where, right. where would you right. put it? Orbit is one place. Okay. And hopefully a non-retrograde orbit, right? So geosynchronous and hopefully nothing would perturb it in a million years. Chances are something would, but okay. Hypothetically in orbit. Good. Um, you know, here on earth, it's really hard to make anything that lasts more than a few thousand years. You can even make the pyramids and look at them now and say, wow, those things are 5,000 years old and you know they don't look so great. And probably in another 5,000 years, they're not going to look good at all. And, and they might last eventually till a hill of, you might have a, a little hill of sand in a hundred thousand years, but that's going to be about it. And that's made out of rock, right? Mount Mushmore, same thing. It's going to be gone in, in 10,000 years. You won't probably even recognize it. it'll be too worn. Um, even mountains in millions of years become deserts, right? Uh, time moves on. Uh, then you have the subduction zones of earth that eventually, if you wait long enough on the, on the surface of the planet, it all gets recycled anyways. It's all going to get you know sucked down into the mantle and, and get spit out the other end and, and as new land. So, so nothing is indelible on this planet. It's, it's constantly changing. And, and to create something that can last the, the sands of time, so to speak, is a lot harder than one might think. You know, the few examples we have here on earth um, that are man-made, you can look to the pyramids, you can look at things um, like uh, Stonehenge, but that's a blink of an eye. The, that, those aren't, the, the, that, those were just made a few thousand years ago and they're not going to be around um, you know, for, for a whole long lot of time. That's just not the way earth is. So if we're trying to find some sort of, of some sort of marker chances are you're not going to find it buried in the earth unless it only happened maybe the last 5,000 years ago or so, right? Even some of the most, most dramatic examples of terraforming, let's look at, for example, uh, the meteor impact crater in, in Arizona it happened 60,000 years ago. Um, that's already filling in, you know, in, in another hundred thousand years from now, you may not even know anything ever happened because of the processes of earth and what this planet does. Um, it's constantly erasing what's on the surface and it's constantly burying what lies beneath deeper and deeper and deeper until eventually, it, you know, it gets recycled. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, that's a hard question. You know, what would last long enough for us to go back and say, wow, this is an indicator of alien life on this planet 100,000 years ago. What would you have to do to, to achieve that, to accomplish that. Um, it's a lot harder than one might think. 
And then again, would you recognize it? Uh, one might say, well, DNA. DNA is a perfect example. If you wanted to, to do something that was enduring for humanity, that we could look back 100,000 years ago and say, yes, that was absolutely manipulated by an intelligent life form. Well, deoxyribonucleic acid uh, may be one way to do it. You can put coding and sequencing in there that will perpetuate over time and time. And yes, you'll have some de degradation over generations. But, but in essence, you could do something that way. And it basically, it's a biological marker, right? So we have to be careful when we say we look for, for evidence because evidence isn't just necessarily a spearhead found in the Bighorn Mountains from 11,000 years ago. It's not necessarily a pyramid sitting in the middle of a desert. It could be far more sophisticated than that. You said put it in orbit, right? Well, what if, if we put that rather than an orbit, we put it into the human body, you know? So anyways, that's, that's, that's so I know it's a very long winded way to answer that question. Yeah. Let me ask a quick follow up, and then we'll get to super chat questions, audience questions and so on. Are there places that we should be looking for evidence that you feel like we're not? So for example, I mentioned archeological investigation sites. The reason I brought that up is some people say craft were found. Okay. But you're also saying there may be other markers, maybe possibly biologically, for example, you know, um, near earth celestial bodies like the moon where you don't have atmospheric friction you don't have the, the you don't have the tectonic processes that we have here on earth that are constantly recycling you know you know someone might want to put something on the moon um if you want to you know reminiscent of um what was it uh, 2001 space 2000 space 2001 space odyssey right where you have these these monolithic markers um that's certainly one way to do it you know, you could put something uh, where you don't have those those same um, those same processes occurring. Where maybe you you could you might be able to extend your time twice as long for leaving some sort of archaeological evidence. Um, the evidence could be right here, could be right in front of us, could be within genetic sequencing. Uh, it could even be more obvious than that. It could be the very fact that we're alive and we're on this planet is, is an example of, of some intelligent life somewhere making a decision that life needs to exist on this planet. Um, we need to be open to all of that. We, we really do. I, I think um, we need to cast a very wide net. And this is why we say all options have to be on the table until they're not on the table, because you might be surprised. Um, something that's super, super intelligent probably isn't going to build a pyramid uh, that's only going to last, you know, 20,000 years. They're going to do something that's far more enduring, something that will really be, you know, no kidding, you know, uh, maybe in I understand. years. All right. This question comes from Terry Ruckert. Mr. So I got to ask real quick, Kurt, I don't mean sure. to know what, what is, forgive me. And I, and I know I'm going to get a lot of hate for this. What is a super chat? I hear it a lot. What, what's a super chat? A, well, a super chat is when someone pays $5, $50, $100 sometimes. Most wow. of these are 5 to $10. You'll get your check. Uh, <laughs> don't even say that because people are going to believe know, it not, okay okay Kurt, well, clear the record I, man yeah you know, yep yep i'm not I'm, getting paid a penny yeah, for this I know. I'm, I'm kidding i'm kidding everyone <laughs> okay <laughs> thank, and thank you so much for supporting thank you so much for supporting this podcast i tremendous i appreciate it a tremendous amount it's not easy to do this full time and this is like such, this is a place where i have almost no knowledge in lou as you could probably tell by the by the 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 sophomoric nature of my questions. Kurt, I don't think anybody does. You're not alone, brother. You think I do? You think I have, if I have all the answers? Don't you think I, 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 we'd be where we are today? No, I've got more questions than answers, but that's okay. You know, my fear is when people say they do have all the answers. Those are the people that I don't, I don't trust because I know they don't. You know, I've been in this for a long time for the U.S. government, and I damn sure don't have all the answers. You know, so no, don't, don't, don't worry about it. Okay, let's get to the super chat by Terry. Terry, Mr. Elizondo has called the UAP craft multiple times, made comments about not knowing who is piloting them. This seems like an assumption, at least without proof. Does this mean there is proof, let's call that evidence because proof in science doesn't exist, that these are craft with pilots? Well, let's break it down craft. Um, craft is a, is a noun. It's a, it's a physical object. Um, that allows the transportation of, of something from point A to point B. Um, whether it's a hovercraft, right, or a spacecraft or an aircraft, um, you know, it's, it's a vehicle, um, you know. And so what defines a vehicle? Well, physical material. There's, there's something to it, nuts and bolts. Um, I've made it very clear already my opinion about um, 
my 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 assertion that there is material that is related to this topic that has been recovered um, in the past. That's that's all I can say about that. But that's why that's why I use the term craft. Um, it's it's a maybe not the best term, but to me it's it's fairly accurate. At least until I can find another term that's more accurate. As far as piloted or or manned, um, I'm not sure manned is the right way to way to say because you know that means there's a human behind it. And I'm not sure that's the case, um, but being piloted uh, or intelligently controlled. Well, the way they maneuver and the way they respond to us, um, think of in the scientific world, stimulus versus reaction. Um, we can provoke and elicit responses from these things. So, if, you know, Dave Fravor said, when I came in and to close the gap on this thing, this thing reacted to me. First of all, it pointed at me and then it maintained a safe distance and mirrored my, mirrored my, my maneuvers. Um, so there is some sort of intelligence behind it. That's not random. That's not, that's not Brownian movement, right? That is, that is, that's a deliberate action. By, There's by justification some... in calling it craft other than yeah. that there may be pirates. correct. And something or someone is, is making a decision how these things perform and react. So I think it's fair to say that there is some, they are intelligently controlled craft of some sort now much beyond that um you know i think i think that's that's up for debate are there potential photos that exist that show occupants in some of these quote-unquote craft well there's a lot of photos that show a lot of things the question is are they real are they legitimate um you know uh, are there potential photos that have potentially deemed as legitimate that have that quality um, there are very compelling photos out there that seem to show something inside some sort of occupancy. And I'll leave it at that because it, it's, it's, it gets really murky much beyond that. Um, and there's a lot that can, can be speculated. And so I, I try to avoid speculation as much as possible, but yes, um, I've spoken to enough people, uh, firsthand knowledge that, that, um, not only report the crafts that we, we know exist, but, but potentially um, some sort of, of uh, intelligence inside these, these vehicles. You mentioned it gets murky. Murky as in low resolution or murky? What do you mean by murky? Uh, I mean in every, every aspect. Um, the source of the information, how the information was obtained, uh, under what circumstances, um, resolution of photographic evidence, all of it. And so that's why we have to be very careful. Okay. This question comes from James Shamsey. Ross Coldhart said it would be good to offer a deal to those who kept the program secret. They get some immunity in exchange for getting us the truth. I think he referenced truth and reconciliation. Would you guys go back? Would you guys back a change.org style petition for this? Do you think yeah. that the others would like it? Absolutely. I think Ross is 100% correct. I think we need to offer amnesty uh, from, from criminal and civil prosecution. Um, if we want, uh, you know, them to come out of the shadows, um, you know, there, there, there's a lot of pressure right now and I'm sure they don't, uh, whoever's part of that cabal doesn't appreciate that type of pressure. And so if we could offer some sort of, uh, yeah, truth and reconciliation, I think, I think something to that effect would be very helpful in this cause and say, look, uh, we're not going to label you. In fact, we'll give you anonymity and, and confidentiality. Uh, what we'll do is we'll, uh, if you provide us this information, we'll make sure that kind of like a witness protection program, uh, except for, you know, no one will ever know you were part of this, except for very few people. Um, I, I think that's a great idea. Um, I, think, I think that's what we should be doing. You know, Ross suggested in the previous interview, a hashtag called NASA tell the truth. And so we ran with that. And part of that was tongue in cheek. But then it had me wondering, well, what would be a, an effective way of getting this information disclosed quicker and more truthfully. Well, NASA, look, you guys, it, it's working. NASA, NASA is now starting to have conversations and, and the director of NASA himself is beginning to, to entertain questions about, about this topic. So, so, you know, I, I think that's great. I don't think that's tongue in cheek at all. It's working. Um, you know, I'd give yourself a big pat on the back because I just saw a headline two days ago where he's talking to talking with uh, Abby Loeb and they're going to be having this conversation. So, 
you know, Hey, look, don't look now, but you just achieve part of what you're trying to achieve. Thank you, Lou. What, what would you recommend? What's another avenue? So storm area 51 is a horrible idea. No, yeah, you're going to get a bunch of young kids in trouble and, and potentially really hurt. And this person, uh, James recommended a change.org petition. Truth and reconciliation is also recommended by Ross. What, do you see as an efficient? I think we path? also have to start continue to take an active role in our politics and voting people in who want transparency. Um, we have been victimized too long by our ignorance. We have allowed people to get into the government um, that don't have our best interests at heart, um, that are motivated by politics and not diplomacy, um, and where information is traded like a commodity. And so secrecy is. is is something that is abused for the wrong reasons. And I think that's that's problematic. Um, there are some, some points of light right now in Congress. We see between Senator Harry Reid, which is absolute American hero. You have on the other side of the aisle, Marco Rubio. You have uh, Congressman Gallego and Tim Burchette and, and Walker and, and some other folks now finally coming out and saying, hey, enough's enough. Um, that's that's fantastic. That that's that's how you make a difference, and 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 making sure that the general public goes to them and and, and encourages them and tells them, you know, thank you for doing this. Um, that goes a long way. You know, these people are taking a huge risk to have this conversation, and the more they hear from the public that it's okay to pursue this, the more willing they're going to be be to do it and to have the conversation. And it's working. I just came back from D.C. myself. I'm not going to say who I spoke with, but but. That goes a long way. That that means a lot to them, and it gives them the motivation and the top cover to start asking the hard questions and start poking the executive branch in the chest and saying, "All right, what do you know about this?" And oh, by the way, Secretary of the Air Force Kendall, with all due respect, don't come back and say it's not a priority just because you know we can't prove it's a threat or not. That's like saying a submarine pops out of the uh, Potomac River next to Washington D.C. and because it's not wearing an American flag and you don't know if it's a threat, it's not a priority. That's the wrong answer. Um, you know, that's, that's again, with all due respect to Secretary Kendall, lest we forget who you work for, it's not up to you to decide what is a national priority. Let me remind you, it's not your Air Force. It's our Air Force, and you're doing a job we told you to do. And if you don't want to do it or you are or unable to do it, then we'll find somebody else who can, and you can go back to doing what you were doing before. Um, that's, that's my word of advice. You know, I, I paid my dues in the trenches and I, I know what I, what I swore to do and uphold. Um, sometimes, sometimes people in positions of, of power need to be reminded of that by the people, by the way. So that's what you guys can do. Okay. So right now we've covered some topics like consciousness, UFOs, remote viewing, skinwalker, all topics that would make the traditional skeptic scoff. However, it may be that there's a paradigm shift coming. Short Form has compendious book summaries on the topics of UFOs, consciousness, science, philosophy, spirituality, and the meta issue of anomalous data leading to radical reorientations of current scientific understanding, such as Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which is, by the way, the short form book I've read most recently. How many of your books on Kindle are left essentially unread? How many bookmarks or tabs do you have that you have to bookmark later and those remain unread? Short form makes learning what you've already wanted to learn an eminently trivial task that can be done fairly quickly. Also, refreshing books that you've read in the past is efficiently done via their summaries. They even have exercises which prompt you for retention because there's very little use in accumulating knowledge if it's going to be forgotten later. To get a free five-day trial, visit shortform.com slash TOE, that is TOE, and you'll also get 20% off the annual subscription, at least for the next 500 people. So perhaps you want to pause this video and visit them. Their extremely clean UI makes it wonderfully delightful to read. And I have a taxophobia, which means that I find this to be an underrated facet that I haven't seen in virtually any other place. Dan Zetterstrom of the UFO podcast and the link to his podcast will be in the description. His and Andy's asks. Great guy, by the way. He's doing a lot of great work. Yeah. That's why great, great lead in, by the way, because when you're asking what can you do, that's a guy who's and like what you're doing is exactly what you could, you guys should be doing. Great, great. A tip focused on military encounters. Did you ever come across cases where people had experienced high strangeness similar to that found on Skinwalker Ranch? For example, have any pilots reported things like the hitchhiker effect? You know, 
What a great question. And I know, <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm going to have to buy, uh, buy Dan a beer for that one. Um, great for, by the way, I could, he's putting me on the spot and, and, uh, you know, that's, 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 that's a great question. Um, I want to answer this as accurately as I can without, 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 um, giving anybody the wrong impression. Uh, there's a reason why the six observable is biological effects. Okay. Um, that by definition is high strangeness. Um, people after an encounter experiencing certain physiological and psychological uh, um, things. Um, again, I, 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 let me, let me, to put it succinctly, yes, but not not the same as as the Skinwalker Ranch. Um, Differences being, well, you know, Skinwalker was looking at a lot of the the the, the paranormal aspects, um, as you say, in the vernacular, you know, uh, shapeshifters and uh, I uh-huh. guess uh, I see. was put I see. once as ghosts and 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 you know, uh, poltergeist, that type of activity, whereas ATIP was looking at nuts and bolts UFOs. Um, but there, there were some, some, some parallels, um, some people, uh, and the question, the problem is we don't know, we really don't know enough about that, um, about the UAP p- issue to really, to really speak cogently on that. Um, people have had biological effects and that's as, that's as far as we were prepared to go at the time. Uh, because that could be quantified and qualified. You, you can look at physiology and morphology and you can look at things like that. And you can look at, at, at tissues and things like that. You can quantify and qualify. The other stuff is a lot harder, um, especially anything dealing uh, with, with the, uh, you know, a psychological episode. When I say psychological, I mean, in a bad way, not like it's made up. I mean, everything we do is interpreted psychologically, right? It's, 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 there's a mental process that goes along with it, with a physical experience. Um, PTSD is a perfect example. PTSD is very, very real, but it's a psychological uh, response to a, to a physiological and emotional type um, situation. And uh, very much the same way, you know, people, people will, will process data differently, um, just like PTSD. Uh, and, and no different in this topic. You know, you have people in some cases I've talked to who, like Dave Fravor, just wants to get behind the wheel of one of these things and learn how to fly it. Uh, then you have other people who've been 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 deeply and emotionally impacted by this and still carry that with them for whatever reason they've they've come up close and personal and um, you know it's it's caused a, it caused some sort of conflict internally. Um, I'll tell you a great guy, it's a super super guy. Um, he was on one of the episodes of um, of Unidentified and he 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 carried the secret around. He he told his chain of command he was up in Canada doing a. A, uh, a maneuver with the United States and him and his buddy uh, were, were situated fairly close to each other, um, guarding some, you know, an AMO field, maybe like a depot out in the middle of nowhere and, and encountered a UFO. Well, they go to report it, um, but his buddy recants the story and says, no, it's all made up because of the, 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 the backlash that they received. And, and he always maintained the story and he was, he was left out in the cold and people thought he was crazy. And he carried that around for a long, long time until one day his buddy come out and, and vindicate him. He says, you know what? Cause I talked to the guy. He said, it was real. Every bit of it. I was there, but uh, I didn't want to catch crap any longer. Um, so I recanted the story and, and I left my friend out there to, to, to flap in the wind, so to speak. And um you know, it, I, that caused a lot of, a lot of, I'm sure a lot of issues. Imagine, you know, being part of something in, extraordinary. And then uh, the person that saw it with you telling the world, nah, you know, we're just kidding. We didn't really see it. And you know, you did and have to carry that for 20, 30 years only to come back later. His name's Dave Marceau. Uh, he's, he's a great guy. If you ever get a chance to meet him, I highly recommend you have him on your show. Um, he carried that around his, you know, in his soul for, for, for decades. And, um, you know, you, you should ask him the type of, of uh, emotional cost uh, it, it, it took on him. 
um, you know, people call you crazy. People call you a liar. People call all sorts of things only at the end to find out that, you know what, you were right. <laughs> and it did happen. And the witnesses are coming on us saying, yeah, it did happen. Um, you know, that, yeah, there's, there's, you know, you say hitchhiker effect. I, I, you know, some folks swear that once you have one of these encounters, there's, there's this hitchhiker effect. And, and now all of a sudden, all sorts of weird things start happening to you and your family. Um, you know, there's an individual that I, that I am very, very, very close to who was very senior in this effort, um, who at some point when it comes out of the shadows, you should probably have this conversation with that person. Um, because I'll tell you absolutely yes. But, you know, again, I, I, I don't have any data that can be quantified or qualified. So I, I, I cannot speak definitively on it. I think we have to remain open, um, that, you know, there's a whole lot of things that are possible. And I know you said you don't have data that's quantifiable, but I'm curious about this hitchhiker effect or the sixth observable. Is that associated with proximity to the craft or length of time looking at the craft, wow. like another variable? Damn, great, What is associated you're, with you're this? You're great question, man. Um, let me take a pass on that for now. I'll, I'll let, let me, um, that will be addressed. Um, sure. We'll get to... Great question. Thank you. We'll get to Scott Larkin, who says, there's some Latin, and then says, Lou, I believe your service to God and country will be understood more clearly in the history books. Are you aware of the CIA's paper known as Adam and Eve event, the Adam and Eve event? How much of what is going on is currently related to this pending event? I've heard of it, but I don't know anything about it. Um, I've always made it very clear up until recently, I really haven't done much reading on this because I never wanted to have any type of bias, um, even, even subconsciously. People get mad at me. Well, you know, didn't you read this report? Didn't you read that report? Look, I, I read government reports, man. That's what I did. That was my job. And I didn't want to muddy the waters by, you know, uh, all these other things out there. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's interesting. Then there's a lot of stuff that's crap. You know, there's a lot of conspiracy BS out there. That's just nonsense and garbage. And then there's some stuff that's, you know, pretty, pretty accurate. Um, so I, I, I've heard of the Adam and Eve, um, if you will, uh, but I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not overly familiar with it. So it wouldn't be really good for me to comment because I, I don't know the details of it. Now, if you can paraphrase for me, I can give you my opinion on it. Um, are you aware of, of Kurt of that? Of no, that, I was uh, going to get you to explain to the audience as well as myself. Yeah, I'm not, I wouldn't be the guy to do that. Um, okay. So Scott, if you want, please paraphrase it and then let's get back to it. Someone wants to know, for those who maybe don't know, what's the main difference between OSAP and ATIP? Uh, what involvement, if any, did you have with OSAP? Well, now I can talk about it because, you know, the guy came out. Um, so uh, Jim Lacassi is a great guy, um, super smart. I've always said he's probably the greatest rocket scientist our, our government had at the time. Um, incredibly brilliant gentleman. Um, and also was one hell of a risk taker. Um, so OSAP, think of Ford Motor Company. Uh, as OSAP. Uh, and they make a lot of models. They make, uh, you know, the Bronco, they make uh, the Crown Victoria, they make the Mustang. Think of ATIP as the Ford Mustang. It is a submodel built under within the Ford plant. Uh, and it's a sports car. Um, it's one of the many different lines. There's of that technology. word sports car again. Sports car, right. Um, Bob Lazar reference. So what happens with OSAP when uh, think of a uh, Ford Motor Company eventually going out of business for whatever reason, um, but the Ford Mustang is so popular that the Ford Mustang continues to be built under its own moniker and continues to be built as the Ford Mustang, but there are no other, there's, there's no other cars now being built by the, by the, by the, okay. it's just so it's a baby Mustang. of, and the parents died. Uh, it's yeah. So it started off, look, there would be no a tip without OSAP and without Jim Likaski. Um, that's a fact. Um, but when that program went away, ATIP continued. And that's why you have all the videos out there from the Roosevelt and all these other incidents that will be coming to light and continue to come to light because a lot was done under ATIP, but it was military focused only. We did not do civilian information at all. It was military focused. And, um, you know, we, we, we did have funding. Um, I'll leave it at that. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say anything to disparage my, my good friend, Jim, 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 
uh, is a good man and he's done a lot for this country. Um, but you know, I, I, I can't speak for OSAP. I can only, and I've said that from day one, as you notice, I've always said, you know, I can't speak for OSAP one day that guy will come forward and hopefully we can stand shoulder to shoulder and he'll finally get the credit that he deserves. Um, but, uh, you know, OSAP wasn't ATIP and ATIP wasn't OSAP. You know, I was, I was ATIP. He was OSAP. And, uh, if you want to know more about you know the OSAP stuff, you probably have to ask him. Okay, now you mentioned the word woo quite a while ago, and just so you know, I don't. Firstly, I don't use that word because that word is used disparagingly, and also because much of what's considered pseudoscience becomes science, and also what you categorize as being paranormal depends on your assumptions of what normal is, and we don't have a theory of everything, so it's difficult to say. Given that, what's your opinion on remote viewing, and? I believe you dabbled in that. So I would like to know, well, I just like to know more about that. Okay. So remote viewing is a, um, is defined as a human cognitive capability to uh, observe things separated by space and time. In essence, um, uh, I'm not going to discuss what um, I've done in my, my career. I've done a lot of things in my career for my country. Um, most of it, as you probably agree, uh, has never seen the light of day and it's not really germane or relevant to, to this discussion of UAP. The UAP topic is only one aspect of my career and my service to my country. Um, but the rest is private unless, you know, doesn't need to be. Um, I don't think uh, a discussion on, on remote viewing has anything to do with, with UAPs, uh, or my time in the ATIP program. And I think it's just a distraction. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, so this question comes from AWAF, AWAF Soul. With the phenomenon being so evasive, what level of confidence do we have that global disclosure will be a net positive for engagement with it? As an analogy, we know hornets exist, but poking the hornet's nest is ill-advised. Can you repeat that, Kurt, one more time? That's, that's, I think that's a really, if i get getting it right, that's actually a really, really interesting question. So AWIF Sol asks, with the phenomenon being so evasive, what level of confidence do we have that global disclosure will be a net positive for engagement with it? As an analogy, we know hornets exist, but poking the hornet's nest is ill-advised. Well, let's define engagement. Is engagement the same as poking? Um, I, I don't think so. Uh, international engagement is getting everybody on the same sheet of music about the topic. It's not necessarily uh, being provocative. It's not necessarily poking, quote unquote, the hornet's nest. Um, what it is, it's an acknowledgement that the hornet's nest exists and that hornets exist and we should probably understand them. Um, I'm not, I'm not uh, at all advocating that we go and poke the hornet's nest. What I'm advocating is that we need to study the hornet and we need to study where the hornet lives and how it lives and its relationship to its environment and ultimately its relationship to us, if any. I think the last time we spoke about transmedium, that it would go from mm -hmm. water to air, back and forth. Is there any evidence of transmedium with respect to rock? Can it move through solid material? I've heard people speculate that. We haven't seen that, but there are some. There were some scientific models, specifically a couple calculations um, that I was privy to in math, the mathematics specifically, that indicate if you can get a certain number below a zero, then then uh, quote unquote, it can cut through, through rock like butter. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a math expert and I'm certainly not going to validate or verify that because I don't know. All I saw were a bunch of numbers and, and letters of the alphabet put in front of me in a very long strain of what, you know, I presume to be valid equations. Um, but I, uh, I, I don't know, you know, my, math for me was a minor. I think I got up to Calc three and, um, you know, true story. I'll share this with you. Um, sure. You know, I, 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 I appreciate math and, 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 and love certain aspects of math, but I'm not necessarily great at math. Um, and uh, finally, I was, in, I was going up to Calc 3 and my professor, um, my professor failed me the first time around. So I had a chance to make it up and I go back to the same professor. And by the way, my professor really didn't like me very much. And really, I, I didn't take, I didn't take it as seriously as I should. Okay. Um, and so um, time and time again, I'd come in and I wouldn't do good on the tests. And uh, finally I, I told him, I said, look, um, <laughs> I'm having, I'm having a trouble here with this class. He says, yeah, you are. And he said, look, you're not really a really good 
I don't think this is for you. That you're not a great student in, in, in Calc three. And I said, no, I agree with you, but you got to pass me because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making some decisions in my life. And this is really the last class I need to graduate. And he said, well, you know, you're just, you're just not make, making the standard. And I said, and well, then you intimidated him with your muscles. No, on the contrary, what I told him is that I, I, I said, listen, I, I don't like being any here any more than you want me being here. And I'll make you a promise. Um, if you fail me again, I promise you, I will continue to be here and take your class every single day, every single day until you retire. That oh, wow. And okay. he looked at me commitment. and he said, so I guess we have a mutual understanding that you're just going to barely pass. And I said, sir, that's all I need. I, I'm not looking for an A. I just need to pass this class and I'll be out of your hair forever. And he said, okay, <laughs> we have an agreement then. <laughs> and that is, uh, I, 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 I just barely passed that class. And um, yeah, it's either Calc 2 or Calc 3. And um, we made an agreement. He, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't take calculus anymore for the rest of my life. And, um, you know, there you have it. That number that was less than zero or could be less than zero. Do you happen to remember if it was mass? Uh, I have no idea, brother. I, I know who, who gave it to me. I don't want to reveal that right. person right now. Let's but, forget about that. You know, so, hey, honestly, by the time they got through the whole, whole, uh, my eyes had rolled in the back of my head about three times. Um, and um, they were obviously very excited about as I were writing these formulas down. And so, bam, there's the answer. I'm like, huh? What, what, where? <laughs> No, see for me math is what turns me on i love it no don't get me wrong i i wish i wish i i i absolutely love math it's it's just doing it that for me is kind of kind of challenging um okay so alien alcoholic asks potentially have there been biological samples recovered from craft let's rephrase that question have there potentially been biological samples recovered yes mm. i'm not going to expound anymore. right 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 so let's forget about the craft and and be careful when i say that i'm being purposely very open and vague at the same time right what does that mean well it means what it means senzu bean has he ever considered that when the uap changes direction or speed it may actually be warping space time like the, like certain warp drives, I'm sure you've heard of. That way, the space time around the UAP is warped, and so it's not technically moving, and thus the biological entities, if there are one or any, wouldn't feel G forces. Have you considered that? Essentially, is what Senzu Bean is. Uh, yeah, it's right on the money. Except for except except for it is moving, but it but that the principles of what that question is are right on the money. Yes. And then I just wanted to say I always love when people say this at the end hopefully my question makes sense as i'm not a native english speaker kind regards hey man your question makes complete sense you know what he speaks better english or she speaks better english than most most english speakers so congratulations i understood the question perfectly and and it's a great question and yeah okay so this question comes from steve cambian of truth seekers and i'll put a link to his podcast in the description given the debate about your involvement with atip and your actual role would you be able to prove your leadership role by releasing tax forms? Tax forms. In short, could you simply release your tax form tax forms to prove your employment, leadership role, and your salary for those years? Yeah, of course, I could. But tax forms just tell you you were, you were working at a particular office. That's all it does. Um, and of course, then you know you you start people start looking at your your salaries and start you know making all sorts of inferences the bottom line is that the government has already validated and verified that i work uh within the usdi um senator reed has already validated work on on a tip um you had the spokesperson for the pentagon dana white under um under secretary mattis already verify that i was working a tip you have jim likaski verifying I worked and ran a tip you have I mean it, it list goes on and on and on and on no I'm not going to get into a tit for cat um you know if, if you don't want to I mean that on the world's greatest clairvoyant because everything I've talked about has come to fruition to include the release of the videos that are on the 1910 with my signature well, on both it. are remarkable I mean at this point if, if if people still question that then you know I, I don't know what to tell you um you know uh, go get a hobby, you know, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and, at this point in time 
you know, there's an IG evaluation and investigation specifically because of, of how they mishandled this. And then they come out and they say, oh, by the way, we deleted all loose emails. I mean, if you're that much of a sucker and you actually, you know, still at this point are, are, are at all questioning what my role is, then, you know, I don't have to tell you. Sorry. Okay. This question comes from Ina Etter. Question for Lou. What can we do personally to prepare ourselves and perhaps even others you know for Hold a, a post-disclosure world? Are we taking a break? You need to... No, no. Actually, coffee? I was trying to find an email that... I, that never mind. I, I had an email that I've never shown, but I was about to say here, boom, boom. How's that for proof? But no, don't worry about it. I don't even okay. want to get into that. It's, it's you know what... It's, we'll talk about that potentially. It, I'm there. not going to satisfy anybody's at this point questioning. You know, it's all that is, is, and by the way, as time goes on, even more evidence is coming. So, you know, you find it to be a distraction and a waste of time. We have much greater issues. Well, and at this point it's just insulting. It's like, dude, I, I can't think for you at this point. I mean, if at this point you're, you're still on the fence on that, then, you know, find something else to do because it's, yeah, it, it's, it, I, it would be like seeing Obama's birth certificate and then saying that he's still from Kenya. You'd be like, what more do you want from me? Yeah. It's like, dude, what more do you want? You have the guy who ran the program, the Senator himself saying, I ran it. I mean, you have the Pentagon saying now you have 60 minutes who, by the way, backed it up with general Mattis himself. I'm like, what more you want? I mean, uh, you want a video of me going in out of the office when I was there? Well, you're not going to get that. <laughs> you know, sorry. Um, you know, I, unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there that are still, I, I consider agent provocateurs. They're just trying to, to, to confuse the situation. And for whatever reason, you know, I mean, it, rather than looking at the last four years and say, wow, look how far we've come, you know, they rather go back and, and you know, it's. <laughs> have you heard of Anjali? I have. Okay. See. People keep telling me to look her up, and then many other people keep saying, don't bother, she's way out there, which also makes me want to look her up even further. And I think I've been on some polls, and you've been on some polls, is who should she take with her as a representative or as one of several representatives for the planet Earth? Well, I never said I'd go with her, first of all. So I don't know why someone's using my name you know, in a poll without my permission saying that, you know, they'll take me anywhere, you know, I, no one's taking me anywhere unless I want to go somewhere. Um, two, um, you know, the old saying extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Um, you know, nothing would make me happier if she can, you know, take somebody to a, a magic cave underground and, and have communication with a, with another life form. Um, but if that's the case, then what are you waiting for? Why not go now? Just bring a camera crew, go now. You don't need to make a big deal of this. Um, just go and do it and prove it. You know, I, I, this we've seen this in the community so many times before with people making these bold claims. And, you know, man, I really hope I'm wrong. I'd love to eat my hat. You know, I'll be the first one. There's an old saying we have, you know, if, if, if I'm wrong, I will kiss her butt in front of Macy's window. Um, I, I Nothing would make me happier than that, uh, than to, to, that to be true. But everything about how this is unfolding doesn't seem, doesn't seem legit to me. Um, it seems showboat, you know, when you have someone sitting on a chair with, well, anyways, you know, I, I don't want, look, I don't want to be judgmental. Enough people are judgmental about me. I know how it feels. You know, I, I want, I want to give Angeli a fair shake, but, but you better produce because if you don't, you got a lot of people riding on this and all you're going to do is hurt the cause, you know, with some outlandish claim like this. If you can't prove this outlandish claim, all you are going to be responsible for is being another one of those people that are, that are tinfoil hat and the reason why this topic was never taken seriously. So add yourself to the list if, if you can't, if you can't deliver. When I looked at her and I didn't look at her much, I just saw a couple of videos. I didn't sense any dishonesty, but I didn't have a, I didn't have anything like a close gander, let's say. So you sense some grandstanding or showboating? No, no, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge anybody. I'm, I'm not, I'm not. I'm just simply saying that, you know, if, if you've got extraordinary claims like that, you, you've got to deliver, you've got a responsibility now and, and you better not have an excuse not to deliver that. All right. So this question comes from Ina Etter. I believe that's how you pronounce this person's name. What can we do personally and even societally to prepare ourselves and others for a post-disclosure world? 
I'm not sure we need to prepare at all. I think we're perfectly prepared. I, I have faith in in human beings that we will look at this from a, a rational perspective. You know, we are our paradigm is challenged every day. Uh, we just had uh, in the media, um, you know, China launch a hypersonic cruise missile around the world. Um, you know, that's that's a change in the way we 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 see ourselves. Um, especially with, with potential foreign adversaries. We have our paradigms change every day. Um, people are told that they have cancer every day. People are told that spouses are cheating on them every day. People are told that they're pregnant and are going to have kids every day. People are told about uh, the death of a loved one every day. Um, we're human beings. That's part of life. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure there's anything we can do to prepare um, I think just just be ourselves and be willing to ask the the, the hard questions and and uh, have the patience to 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 find the answers. You know, let's not be so quick to to jump into some sort of preconceived narrative just because it makes us feel good, right? Because we all want we all want to understand things that we don't. We all have this natural fear of things we can't understand. Um, we must be tempted not to create an artificial narrative uh, just so we feel better. Uh, we, we need to really explore this for what it is and, and have the courage to do so. Um, that would be my advice. Okay. I need to urinate. Do you need to use the washroom? <laughs> uh, I will. If, if you have time, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know how you're, let's just get folks, going. I'll you sure put, yeah, I'll turn this off and turn off the audio. Well, I'll keep mine on. Not that I plan on necessarily going here, but I actually have a bathroom. I I'll think use. I'll, people I'll may like that. <laughs> be right back folks. Thanks. All right. Okay, for those who are in the chat, don't worry if you've super chatted and I didn't get to your question because I'll read them all at the end I, and I will also prioritize them for the next time when I speak with Lou, provided he's generous enough to speak with me again. <laughs> Two hours later. All right, Kurt, I'm going to give you some 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 hell here. I know you didn't have time to go to the bathroom and wash your hands in that that. Short <laughs> Uh, okay, well, <laughs> I'm extremely <laughs> quick. I, I just hey, you put crushed. me on the spot, man. I, at least I, I should be able to put you on the spot a little bit too. All right. Okay, let's see. By the way, these are some really good questions. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, well, Helpful this is questions, questions that people haven't asked me before. Yeah, man, really good. By the way, let me also caveat here. You're going to get, I do have some people that really don't like me and I'm sure they're going to take out that uh that hatred on you so i apologize ahead of time if anybody is screaming at you i got some i got some uh, some haters in my camp um that uh tend to be rather vocal so i i, I hope they're not driving you too crazy no i've got uh, a nice little vocal i almost I, well, I call them my 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 chorus because uh, i know every time i come out and say anything like on this show uh that chorus is going to come out any minute now and uh, I can I can already hear them, uh, you know, warming up their yeah. <laughs> their voices. <laughs> uh, the last time we spoke, there were two comments that you said that stood out to me. Well, one was the somber, the somber heard around the world, in a sense, and then you clarified that, or you added to that by saying sobering. Oh, I was wondering we can get to that. And then also you mentioned that the charlatans of the world will be shown to be charlatans, and I again don't know much about this UFO community, but people in the comments were saying, did he mean Stephen Greer? So why don't you comment on that? Ooh, you can be as man. diplomatic as you like. I know that you're a, you're a relatively um, diplomatic person. Yeah. Let me, um, let me start with by, by somber or sobering. Um, imagine, imagine everything you've been taught. Uh, whether it's through Sunday school or through uh, regular formal education in school or what our political leaders have told us. And yes, even maybe our mothers and fathers around the dinner table have told us, or maybe at bedtime um, about, about who we are, right? And our background and our past. Um, what if all of that turned out to be not entirely accurate? In fact, the very history of, of, of our species, um, the meaning, what it means to be a human being and our place in this universe. What if all that is now 
in question. What if it turns out that a lot of the things that we thought were one way aren't? Are, are we prepared to have that honest question with ourselves? Are we prepared to, to recognize that we're not at the top of the food chain, potentially? That we're not the alpha predator, that we are uh, maybe somewhere in the middle? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I was having discussion with a friend uh, not too long ago, a really, really, we call them gray beards in the, in, in the government, really, really smart guy. I'm not going to mention his name, but, but I was talking to him probably a couple months ago. And this is a guy who was always paid to solve the hard problems for the U.S. government. Cold War. How do we solve that, right? How do we do these big, big things? How do we go in and, and, uh, and, and beat the Russians at their own game? Um, so this guy I respect tremendously. And, and we had a conversation. He said, you know, Lou, um, mankind's been around for a little while. And for most of that time, mankind's been around. We've been smack in the middle of the food chain. We've been, um, you know, we, we, we ate a lot of things. A lot of things ate us. And that's just the bottom line. And about 70,000 years ago, something fundamentally changed. Something changed. And, and our species was instantly catapulted to the very top of, of our planet as far as predatory animals. And, um, and now all of a sudden, we became the most feared. Um, we, we, we were the most lethal uh, and the most successful. And in fact, uh, most of the large species that, that, that existed on this planet went extinct because of us believe it or not, because we, we were <laughs> eating all of it. Um, there were a couple species that did very, very well with our ascension, our immediate ascension. And we brought a couple species with us. The dog is an example where the dog species benefited greatly with mankind's ascension as the alpha predator and, and, and wound up succeeding as well, very, doing, doing very well off of that. That changed the, the entire global landscape of our planet um, almost overnight. Large animals went extinct. Um, because of us. What if it turns out that there's another species that um, is is even 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 higher on, on the on that on that ladder than we are? Um, do we need the social institutions that we have today? Will we need governmental and, and religious organizations that we have today? If it turns out that um, there is something else or someone else um, that is that is uh, technologically more advanced, and and perhaps from an evolutionary perspective more advanced, um, have we been wasting our time all this time, or are we doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing? Um, are we? Are, are we? Does it turn out that mankind is is in fact just another animal in the zoo or because we thought ourselves as a zookeeper before, but maybe we're just another exhibit inside the zoo. What would that mean to us? So, so when I say sombering and sobering, uh, I mean that it's, it, you know, there's going to come a point in this conversation where we're going to have to do a lot of reconciling with ourselves, whatever that means from whatever philosophical background you you have. Um, this is going to impact every single one of us the same and yet equally and yet differently. Um, and I think that's important. Um, you know, do we find ourselves in a situation where history may have to be rewritten? Um, so that's what I meant. Now, as far as the charlatans, I'm not going to give any attention to individual charlatans because they already have enough attention. They know exactly who I'm referring to. These are individuals who have, have, have made a, a cottage industry, a career of taking people's hard-earned money and deceiving them. And not only deceiving them, but having them sign non-disclosure agreements to make sure they don't tell the world that they've been deceived. And preying upon people who, who for whatever reason, believe in them. Um, uh, People who say my narrative is the only narrative and anybody else who tells you otherwise, um, you know, is, is trying to hurt you. 
Um, I have all the answers. I have the solution. Anybody who says that, I think, um, I think it's a charlatan. And, and I think we need to be very, very mindful of that. They're very dangerous. Uh, and they're dangerous for several reasons, because if they're lying to you about that, they're probably lying to you about other things in their life, their past life and their current life, uh, which may or may not come to light at some point. Um, these are people who, who have taken advantage of people for a very long time. And, uh, you know, you, you have to be careful, you know. What else are the motivations of some of these charlatans or potentially could be their motivation other than financial? Well, look at any religious influence. charlatan. It's the same thing. It's a, cult, it's a cult of personality. It's somebody who, for whatever reason, thinks it's all about them and, and they manage the narrative. It's, it's, it goes to the, to the basic core of pride and ego in human beings um, and narcissistic behavior, um, you know, real, true, deep psychological issues, um, some sociopathic, to be honest with you. Um, is there any gold in that rubble? I'm sorry. Is there any gold in that rubble? As in, is all of what they're saying some of these charlatans? We don't have to name names. I no. I think. I think. I think there's always there's always fibers of truth in 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 a, in a blanket of lies, um, because that's that's what holds it together. There are some there are some aspects of truth. The problem is um, when you take that truth and, and you distort it. You know, there's people in history that that were very good at convincing large amounts of people that they have the answer, right? Um, I don't need to go back into, into history to say which ones those are, but you have characters like Jim Jones, um, Heaven's Gate is an example, um, you know, even Hitler to some degree, where, where they were very charismatic people who, who got people in, in this, this web um, and they didn't realize it until it was too late. And, um, you know, I, I just think when you, when you're creating all these shell organizations and pass throughs and, and paying people off to do things for you to deceive other people, I think is problematic. Again, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to mention names. I, I, I think most people are smart enough to see through it. My concern are those people who, who are already, already sucked into it. It becomes a cult and it becomes brainwashing and, and manipulation. And that's my concern because it gives a terrible name to the, to the, to the effort and, and making false accusations, um, you know, I, I think is, is there's an old saying, and let's see if I can remember it, that um, ye be careful of the knife ye uses to stab at the back of others, for surely that knife will be used against you in the future or at some point. So, you know, um, anyway, being just, you know, right. Karma, karma is a bitch. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> you know, mother nature has a vote. She's got a way of always uh, squaring things up at the end. And um, you know, that's, that's what I've seen anyways. Remember earlier, I was asking you, what can we do as a culture? I think based on some of your statements, what we can do is, something like we've already been doing, which is keep talking about it so that we can destigmatize it. I know that I don't particularly like the word destigmatization. I think it's been taken by certain people, but essentially to destigmatize. However, there does seem to be the tendency from those who are believers in or who are part of the UFO community who deride people like, see, Neil deGrasse Tyson and other skeptics deride the UFO community. And I don't think they should do that. But then I also don't think that they should be met with condescension as well, because I think that that comes back at you. I think that love and extending an arm and an olive branch is what will. Kurt, you're right. You're absolutely right. Let me, let me, if I may, that's, that's a good point. Let me talk a little bit about uh, Mr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. First of all, I, I, he's one of the few shows that I used to watch a lot. Um, I, I loved his perspective and let's talk about his background. You know, this is a person who was a bit of a maverick. He, he, he cut his teeth and became really made his bones by, by, by supporting and defending a theory that really was a hypothesis at the time, an outlandish hypothesis. And that was, there were these supermassive objects 
in our universe that were so dense that they created a gravity well. They created a black hole in space time where light itself couldn't even escape. And although we can't see it uh, directly, we can't prove its existence, we think they're there, right? Now, a lot of the scientific community said that's hogwash. You know, it's, it's just, it, it's a theoretical anomaly that, that isn't real. And yet Neil deGrasse Tyson did exactly that. He, he, he supported the hypothesis and theory that there are these things you'll never be able to see with the naked eye, but they fundamentally, uh, they're there and they're hundreds of millions of light years away. Well, it's funny because that same spirit used to, to, to prove something you can never see that is there, for some reason, he seems to have forgotten that in this topic, because we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about something that is hard to see directly sometimes, um, but we can we can see its impact on, on, on the environment around it. Uh, and to some degree, maybe, you know, warping space time, and, but it's not hundreds of millions of miles away, it's right here. And, and I don't understand how you can support in one hand, the 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 scientific study and research into something called a black hole and not be open-minded to to something like uap it, it to me that that it's um it's the same thought process now um going back to what you say as far as ridiculing them no we shouldn't ridicule them well, what we need to do is help them see the the contradiction in their argument uh, and, and not in a mean, spiteful way either. Um, you know, I, I think we need to have a conversation because we need people like Neil deGrasse Tyson. We need people to 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 who are very smart to look at this problem and not just reject it because of 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 stigma and taboo. But the problem with the scientific community today is that they've rejected science instead favor of scientism, and scientism is no different than any other religion. It's where you are so married to the scientific methodologies that you no longer can accept new hypotheses and theories um, and you reject them flatly. And I think that's problematic because as I've said before, every single principle of science today, whether it's a, a, a theory or a law of science that we accept as just normal part of everyday life in science started off as someone's wacky zany idea. I, way back when everything. And so I, I don't understand how we continue to find ourselves in the same hole every time we keep saying, well, no, there's been, that's impossible, but damn it. Every time you say that you, we get proven wrong. Why w w haven't you learned your lesson? You know, haven't you taken your notes from, from, from the U S patent office when, when they said that <laughs> bold claim that, you know, now, now everything in the world has been invented in a few years ah, right, right, right. for a, a U.S. patent office anymore. I mean, how short sighted can you possibly be? That's, that's the antithesis of scientific pursuit and endeavor. And I think, you know, if you were to ask me my true feelings on this, which again, I don't offer very often, Science and religion, when you are standing at their base, they could not be any farther apart. Think of a pyramid, going to the Great Pyramid of Giza and standing on one side of the pyramid and say, this is science. And then walking around all the way to the other side of the pyramid and say, this is faith. This is religion. And the two could not be further apart from each other. And yet, when you start to climb that pyramid, ah, I see what you're saying. on whichever side you go on, they start to get closer and closer together. In fact, at some point, at the very top, the difference between science and religion are indistinguishable. Um, they are they are not mutually exclusive. In fact, uh, they they uh, they are together. They're one. They're one and the same. And in fact, I think part of the problem is that in science. And in faith, we're asking two fundamental different questions. This is why the two don't get along uh, down at the base of the pyramid. Um, this is why they seem so opposite, because one is asking how, and the other is asking why. And they're two different questions. And that's why the two don't seem to be, don't seem to comport with one another. But ironically enough, the further you go up the ladder, the more you realize they actually require each other, they actually lean on each other, they actually support each other. And and at the very top, there's there's no difference between science and and and, and religion. They 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 become one. 
and they support each other. I think anyways, that's, that's my perspective from, from what I've seen in life. You know, you mentioned a phrase. It's a phrase I don't particularly like. It's that I say a lot of things that people don't like. So I, I, I apologize, Kurt, ahead of time. No, no. It's a, <laughs> I apologize if I'm about to offend you. It's extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The reason I don't like that is because people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, any skeptic will say that to any claim that they've already deemed as being untrue. And even Dr. Brian Keating, who is a He's a, a friend, and he almost won the Nobel Prize. He's an experimentalist physicist. He said, I don't ask my graduate students, go find the extraordinary evidence. It's not a different class of evidence that's called extraordinary. Also, what's the extraordinary evidence that any of us are conscious? There's actually zero evidence that you can point to scientifically outside of what people say. And then, well, what are you going to take what people say? Well, you could just ask a computer, are you conscious? And so on and so on. So that's why I don't particularly like that. Yeah, phrase. I think you're, well, I, I don't disagree with you. I, I, I think that's a really good point. Um, I think I was taking it more in the vernacular, right? So if you're going to say something has been substantiated by observation over and over again, multiple times to substantiate X equals three, right? And now you're going to come out and say, no, actually X equals four, then you are going to need evidence that is beyond what it currently is available to prove that because all the evidence right now is suggesting X equals three. And yet now you are claiming X equals four. Well, that is a, it is by definition, extra ordinary, the ordinary claim being X equals three, right? In simple algebra, but now you're making an extra or beyond ordinary claim that X does not equal three it equals four. So therefore you're going to need beyond ordinary evidence beyond what showing X equals three to prove now your theory that X equals four. And so from my perspective, when I say extraordinary, you know, uh, claims requires extraordinary evidence, I don't necessarily mean um, perhaps the way a lot of people mean. I just mean it's beyond, it's like the word normal versus paranormal. It is it, it, by definition, extraordinary, extra, extraordinary. Um, but I see your point, and I think you're right. I think I think part of the problem is that we we get too comfortable in 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 the current understanding of of uh, of our current paradigm, and we're not willing to challenge uh, with, with sometimes very simple things. You know, um, case in point is I just had this conversation not too long ago publicly about fractals. You know, they've been in front of us all along, ever since we were living in caves, and yet it's only recently we realized that that may be part of the secret to the universe. Right? That that fractals exist everywhere. Uh, they 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 exist physically. They exist uh, from a uh, from a even a psychological perspective. The way we 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 relate to one another. Um, and and it's been in front of us all. It's it's obvious. It's you know it's not really extraordinary at all. It's it's actually blatantly obvious, and we just never saw it. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. I, I think you're right, and and maybe I need to rephrase that in the future. Um, I'll consider that because I think you you may be right. Maybe 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 that's not an entirely good way to to go about it. You know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Maybe maybe we're beyond that in the conversation. So great, thanks for sharing that with me. And no, by the way, you, you did not insult me at all. In okay, fact, I, yeah, I, don't... I appreciate that a lot. Thanks, man. Router router or however you pronounce this, I'll leave the name in the description. It says, great show. Can you ask Lou the following? Based upon what you've learned, Lou, would you consider yourself to be an idealist or a materialist? And Ooh. if you are unsure what those words mean, no, let I me know, know what I... they are. Um, is there an option C? Hmm. Which <laughs> would be what? Mix? Can I be both <laughs> or neither? Um, yeah, that's something I've been wondering. Is there a duality between those two? There's plenty of dualities in math and physics where you think it's the option between two, but it turns out that they're equivalent ways of describing a system. Yeah, exactly. I'm not sure it's a, a either or. I'm not sure they're mutually exclusive. I think, I, you know, I, I my background was science. Um, you know, in, 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 in science, I found my solace, which I enjoyed. Um you know, I, I grew up kind of a kind of a angry young kid. Had some some tough times as a kid, um, but but science to me was um, it was unwavering. Uh, she was always there for me. She never lied to me, and so uh, I, I get lost in science. And um, you know, I I, I I I do believe in the scientific method. Um, it works. It's, it's only, it's, I mean, is it perfect? No, but it's, it's the best thing that we got right now that we know uh, to test and, and apply theories. Um, 
but at the same time, you know, there's something more you said about human consciousness, you know, you can't prove it. There's no, no mathematical formula, no physical evidence to prove consciousness. And yet here we are having a conversation. So um, I think, I don't think, I don't think the two are mutually. I don't consider myself a materialist or an idealist. Um, like I said, it's, you know, I, it, when I make fun, the fact that I, you know, it's, I said, I love humanity. It's humans. I don't like, right. Um, how is that possible? Right. Because humanity is a collective of all the humans. And yet, uh, but um, probably a little bit of both. Probably a little bit. I think there's an indelible aspect to the human being that is um, that transcends physicality. Um, you know, we have a we have a body, obviously, and we have a brain, and our brain is inextricably tied for metabolic processes to survive to the body. The heart has to pump blood to get blood to the brain, otherwise, the brain dies. And in the same respect, the brain is regulating all the autonomic processes for the body. So, you know, breathing, which is automatic. Thank God for most of us, anyways. Uh, and, uh, and, and heartbeat and, and, and temperature and whatnot. So the, the, the brain is a biological organ, uh, organ that is inextricably tied to the overall vehicle, which is the body. And that's organic as well, but there's probably something more to the human being. There's probably something more that is, um, not necessarily physical. Uh, because a computer has a processor, a computer has a body, right? The laptop I'm talking to you on right now, and it's got a processor that's thinking, if you will, for the computer, but it's not a conscious living being. It's not a sentient being. So the question is, what is that extra component, that extra ingredient that makes us human, that makes us a living, breathing, not only animal, but truly human, what separates us from everything else on this planet? And there's that third ingredient can be described potentially in, in, in cultures as the soul or the id or the chi or what, you know, put your nom de jour you want on there. But I think a lot of people agree that there's something different. Um, case in point, the, 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 the notion of love. Um, you can't really describe it. It's hard to describe. You can't see it. You can't touch it and taste it, but it's there and it motivates a lot of people's Actions. In fact, love to some degree actually works against individual survival. And yet a mother's instinct to throw herself in front of a train to save her child is almost reflexive. Um, you know, there's something there that recognizes the value of human life, human dignity. Um, I could be in a car accident and, and, and lose use of my arms and my legs, but I'm still Lou Elizondo. Um, I could suffer a traumatic brain injury and, and um, have a severe TBI and be mentally impaired, but I'm still Lou Elizondo. What makes Lou Elizondo Lou is, is something a little bit different, something that you can't really put your finger on. And so back to this duality, you know, materialist versus, a, you know, idealist, I'm probably a little bit of both because I believe in science, but I also know that there's limitations to science and there's limitations to human beings and there's limitations to you and me and everybody else. And, and that's okay. And that, that there's aspects to, to being human that are probably potentially more human than human to use an old cliche. So um, great question. If I, if I can ask you, Kurt, a question I never asked you, just take a break here for a minute and ask you, what got you into this? Why, why, why did you want to get into this topic and have this conversation with your background. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I suspect you have your, your reasons, but I'd love to know why. Originally, I was what people would categorize as an adamant atheist. And that was recently too, just a few years ago. And I'm not saying I'm a theist now, but I'm not an atheist. And just so you know, some atheists will say they don't believe in God because, well, the concept of God is voluminous and amorphous. How do you pin it down? Well, then technically you can't say you're an atheist because you can't be anti what's cloud-like without exist. yourself being right. cloud-like. You can't be against nothing. <laughs> so, so either way, I was speaking with someone who told me, you know, aliens exist. And I gave him my standard spiel, which is, well, why do they look like us? It's two humans. It came out. The, the reports of aliens spike every time there's a movie, so it seems culturally related. The standard skeptic response. Yeah, anthropomorphism, et cetera, yeah. Right, and also, look, given our exponential curve for technological progress, why do these craft seem 
all alike. Now, of course, they're varied. They're varied in terms of shape and size, but still, they're recognizable as craft. And if you're, let's say, you're coming from a planet far away, then even if you were to travel there, time has you can travel there instant, almost instantaneously, but thousands of years may have passed, and so then your technology would have increased. So I had the standard skeptical response, and then he said, "Kurt, just watch this. Just watch." He sent me a few videos, and I watched them, and then I was. I think I've said this before. If I have any skill, it's not math or physics. It's body language. I watch people's body language like a hawk. And I can tell when they're insecure about a certain aspect of what they're saying, when they don't feel intelligent enough, when they feel intimidated, when they feel like they have to... Well, you can continue on the list. And I didn't see deception in what I saw. And so that got me interested, and I decided to speak to Jeremy Corbell because I was a filmmaker. I still categorize myself as that, and he was one, and still is. So I was like, okay, let me speak to Jeremy. He has a movie on Bob Lazar. And since then, well, I've been interested in it because of the physics, but I'm also interested in the deep mysteries of the world. And it seems like it seems like UFOs tie in to them. And if, even if they don't, it's still incredibly informing. So that's my interest in it. And luckily, or unluckily, I don't have a scornful, despising mind like most of the scientific community. I I don't look upon the subject with ridicule. In in fact I, I don't particularly like when people ridicule other people. I think it, it I think that's an indication they should examine themselves for what they're holding to be a self evident truth. And question their own motivations for believing in it because if there's an emotion attached to it then there's some unconscious motivation for holding that belief that isn't purely a dispassionate assessment of the evidence so that's my reason very well said let me let me ask you a further question if i may then not that i'm interviewing you but, but sure this this is it's actually a question for your audience too but but i can't talk to your whole audience other than addressing you so i'll address you um you know we look in terms of everything from a humanistic perspective and we want to make sense from nonsense. It's just kind of in our DNA, right? Um, when we are talking about the topic of UAP, I think everybody deep down inside has this innate desire for it to, quote, make sense. Put it in a neat little box and it makes sense to us. The problem is the more we talk about UAPs, the more we exchange ideas and then the more we begin to formulate our own opinions about UAPs. And so what happens when the topic of UAP, the truth doesn't comport because we're all doing this right now, subconsciously, subconsciously, every person does it. You are, we are creating these little boxes that we want to check off regarding this topic of it's from outer space, it's from inner dimension, it's this, and they want this, and they can do that, and they can do it today. Mm, or, you know. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Um, and we are building those boxes without even realizing it. So when we ask the questions, we're actually asking the questions in a way to fill those, to check those boxes that we've already made up psychologically in our brain and our subconscious, right? But we have to avoid doing that. And it, it, it's so natural that we yeah. don't even realize we're doing it. How do yeah. we avoid the temptation to ask really the big question without, without being tempted to fill in the little boxes? You know, a lot of the questions your, your, your wonderful audience has asked may not even realize, but they're trying to fill, check those boxes that they've made for themselves in their brain. They've, they've preconceived these little boxes that I must have an answer to this box. Because this box then relates to this and this and this, and this gives me a bigger overall picture and answer that I'm looking for. But, but what if this is even far more bizarre than that? That how do we, how do we ask a question to something we don't even know what questions to ask? Meaning maybe, maybe we're asking, maybe, maybe it's not even in the realm of our ability to really get to the root of this because we're looking at everything from a human perspective, human motivation, human interests, human desire, fears. Um, you know, what if it's something completely different? And, and so in essence, we need to avoid creating these little boxes prematurely in our mind 
Um, which is hard because we're, that's what we do as a species and everything that we do, right. <laughs> you know, uh, take dating, for example, when you go on a date with somebody, what's the first thing you do? So, well, do I like them? Are we compatible? Do we like the same things? Do we like to eat the same, the same dietary, you know, am I a vegan? They're a meat eater, you know, uh, these little boxes that we put in our brain, you know, um, already, but before you even ask the question, we have these, these little voids that you want to fill. And, and, and the question is, how do we, how do we avoid that temptation? How do we how do we pull ourselves out of a human paradigm to ask the questions that maybe aren't human questions at all? I don't know. So I just I'll offer that up to you because that's a great point. There's a term for that. It's called enthymemes. Have you heard of that? No, no. So please explain. If people in the audience, it's just an unstated assumption. You don't realize you're making it when you're asking a question or putting forward a statement. So for example, let's imagine worms, they see humans and they just conceive of humans as godlike. And then they would ask, well, they must eat the best dirt. What dirt do they eat? They don't realize they're asking the wrong question. Exactly. Precisely what my point is. So you, you, what, do you, what do you call it? Enthymeme? Enthymeme. So E-N-T-H-Y-M-E-M-E. If you want a fun physics one, which I could say in like 20 seconds. Ed Witten, so one of the world's greatest physicists, said there's no such you can't no go theorem. So you can't have a particle that has that that is massless and has greater than half spin and also carry a charge that's Lorentz covariant, which means follows Einstein's equations. Okay, which seems like it means there's no such particle as a graviton because graviton has mass. Sorry, has spin two and is massless. Okay, however this unstated assumption that you don't realize, and even Ed Witten didn't realize he was making it, was that the graviton is in the same space-time. And so right. this is one of the reasons that there's this ADS-CFT correspondence where you have holography. You've heard of the holographic principle? Yeah, absolutely. Sure, sure. Because yeah, it seems it. like, well, there's a correspondence between CFT, so conformal field theory, and then having gravity on the boundary of that, or vice versa. Right. So the bound, so gravity could be somewhere else, and there's a correspondence between those Correct, two. correct, correct. But it's actually extremely tricky to extract that from the statement that you can't have a particle that is of greater than spin half and massless and so on and so on. It's it's difficult to see the assumption that in that statement. So that's what an enthymeme is. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's uh, I appreciate that. Thank you, Kurt, for sharing that. That's that. Uh, that if anything, that was worth totally me <laughs> being here. Oh, I man, really appreciate that. I'm just I, I feel so relaxed with you and I'm so I'm so honored that you're spending some time with me, man. Well, it's, it's collective, right? I mean, you got a great audience. You're asking great questions. And, and I feel that, you know, it's, I almost feel like this is like a fireside chat. If we could all just be sitting together out here in Wyoming, you know, in the evening around a fire, this is exactly what I'd be spending my time doing. Um, yeah. You know, this is, this is, I wish I could do this more often. Um, I really do. Unfortunately, you know, much of my, my time is, uh, is committed to, to other endeavors within this effort. But um, I think this is important because ultimately, look, we're going to solve this mystery together, all of us. And this isn't going to be up to Lou. It's not going to be up to Kurt. It's not going to be up to, you know, Greer or anybody else. Uh, it's, it's, it's up to, to all of us. Um, and uh, you know, that old, that old, uh, that old saying, what was it? I saw it recently, somebody, a couple of things. I saw one really neat on the internet, um, you know, with, with somebody who was being angry and someone said, come, let us share smoke at the fire, you know, by the mm -hmm. fire. Uh, this old uh, uh, kind of an indigenous, you know, uh, proverb, right? Saying, "Hey, let's 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 share smoke at the fire. Let's let's put our let's stop grinding the axes. Let's let's put our differences aside. Let's 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 come together." Um, I like that. Another thing, too, by the way, I don't know who does it. It's completely off topic and random, but I'm gonna since I got a little bit of time here, I'm gonna say it anyways. There is an artist uh, that has been drawing me, and I gotta tell you, I don't know if he likes me or hates me. But man, it is amazing artwork, man. This 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 person has somehow managed to capture. It's kind of like a comic book style, um, and usually draws me with these What's tiny name? little beady eyes. I don't know. I don't know. I you know I I, I I've seen it a few times. Um, you know, it's uh, it it's it, it. I don't know if it's like a Japanese anime style. It's, oh, it's really I, it's unique though. Yeah, and uh, again, I don't know if they if they if they hate me or or they love me or, or 
in different. I'm pretty sure it's it's a positive feeling. They wouldn't. But spend man, so much time. I gotta tell you, really, really talented artists, man. I actually screen grabbed a couple of those and just saved them and and showed my wife. I said, man, look at this. This is really clever. You know, um, one of them is uh, it's I guess. <laughs> <laughs> joking leave you know all the work i've done in the government and then all of a sudden now i'm being assigned a ufo program and there's this kind of you know reaction which actually wasn't too, <laughs> too far from the truth uh but just really really talented so big shout out to whoever whoever you are out there um you know again whether you're you're a fan or a hater know that uh, know that i'm your fan either way so so you're very very talented at artwork if you find the person's name or person if you are watching this just leave some comment and i'll put your link in the description as well okay i gotta get to some more super chat and audience questions they're eager do it yourself craft q asks what's his take on alien abduction experience they're interesting they're fascinating but uh, they're just that they're an experience um and with every person who who talks about uh, you know how how these things may be here for peaceful purposes and they've, you know just because they've never uh, attacked us means that they're they're benevolent. There's just as many people who are terrified and and report the opposite experience. Um, you know I've said this before for record. Look, if if you take a member of my family against their will somewhere, that's kidnapping. Uh, and God forbid if you touch them, now that's assault. You know both are criminal. Um, uh, offenses, um, in, from my perspective, um, I don't care what your intent is bottom line. Um, so I, 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 if abductions are happening, um, well, the award of abduction itself is a criminal act, right? It's kidnapping. Um, it's not taking you on a date. It's abduction. Um, if that indeed is happening. Um, the problem is it's very hard to quantify and qualify, um, that, that aspect of the conversation. Because at the end of the day, you're just relying on eyewitness testimony. There's no gun camera footage. There's no radar data to suggest that. It's just someone's personal experience. And when you do that, you have to consider all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, you have to, you're now talking about aspects that involve psychology, uh, aspects that involve, aspects that involve sociology, and aspects that uh, involve philosophy. Um, you know, we all interpret data differently um, as human beings. Um, processes occur differently in our brains and biochemically even. So it's very hard to, to do anything with that data from a military perspective, from a DOD perspective, because, um, you know, eyewitness testimony is one thing, and even that's tricky sometimes. But when you start talking about experiences, physical experiences from people and, and they vary so much in some cases, in some cases are similar. Um, there's not a whole lot I can do with that data. So although it's extremely interesting, fascinating, in fact, um, it was never really a core part of our, our research in ATIP. Um, again, because scientifically it's very hard to quantify and qualify. And there's, there's nobody else that can that can say, yes, I saw this person. There's a few small anecdotal examples here and there where people say, yeah, I saw the person disappear or something like that. But that doesn't help us. We, we, need, we need more information or more data. You know, um, I will tell you. No, actually, no, wait. <laughs> Sorry. Next time. Next time. <laughs> yeah, next time. Yeah, uh, there, there, it, it, it's, it's interesting. Someone asked about why is it that we have cattle mutilations predominantly? We don't hear much about sheep and chicken and so on. Is there... Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is a hicko. That's right. Hicko asks, why is it not on other livestock? Well, I'm sure there's a minor amount, but why is it predominantly on cattle? Or at least predominantly we hear about it on cattle. Yeah, we don't know why. Um, it could be something as simple as just you know the, the bovine genetic sequencing. It could be the fact that uh, you can put a genetic tracer in an animal and, and, and follow the, the natural mutations of the genetic sequencing, uh, the genotype and phenotype uh, manifestations um, over time. Um, you know, if I were to, let's say in the 1950s, put a marker, a specific marker in, 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 a, in a specific uh, herd of cow uh, or head of cattle and then cattle and then, then watch as that, that genetic marker changes over time. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things 
you can you can find. It could also be that certain animals are like canaries in a in a in a in a, in a mine. They just they seem to be more sensitive to whatever reason to to environmental changes or something to that effect. And so you know that is the animal of choice. Um, you know we we don't really know, and and there's still a lot of debate on what what that is of what cattle mutilations are. Some will speculate that it's uh, it's um, you know, UAP related. Some will speculate that no, it's some sort of secret government program to to uh, for for tracking biological weapons testing. Um, others opine that it's something completely unrelated. It's natural. It's caused by coyotes and you know, uh, natural attrition of the of the of the, of the herd. Um, we don't really know, but but assuming, let's just assume for a moment, or I hate to say that word. Let's say let's presume because you know what assuming does, right? So let's we'll we'll presume here instead of assume. Um, let's just presume that it does have some sort of relationship to, to UAP, for example. What, yeah. um, why would we, why would we, why would anybody, why would anything be interested in one particular species? Um, there's all sorts of reasons why. Um, it could be that there is a, a special susceptibility to certain things. Um, again, that going back to the canary analogy, right? That for whatever reason, it's also could be that they're widely available. That there's, you know, I'm, I'm living here in Wyoming. There's more head of cattle here in Wyoming than our people. That's a true statement. We have more cows than we have people. That's one hypothesis I was thinking about. Have you heard of McCready explosion? Mm -mm. It's that the, if you look at the amount so and of any animal by mass, which one is the most plentiful on the planet? It's not humans. Mm -hmm. It's actually cattle yeah. or right. cattle is second to humans. So I'm wondering how much of it is just because there's so many of them that well, there's, there's a lot of numbers and, and it's huge numbers and they're all over, all over the world. Uh, and there are also a lot of them are really, really remote, you know? So if you wanted to get in and get out and do something, you know, cows are pretty easy, easy target, you know, cheetahs run really fast. Right. And, right. and, <laughs> true, and, true, true, and true. alligators That's bite. A, those are great points. Yeah. Okay. So you before know. I rudely interrupted you, you're saying there was the reason of being plentiful of being perhaps susceptible, like a canary in the coal mine. And then you're going on. What was the next? Yeah, uh, it could also be that, you know, they have been, so cows are, are one of the few species that have been specifically manipulated by human beings. Um, you know, there was a time where, where our species hunted something called an aurochs, and the aurochs was, was predominant all over the planet. And we hunted them, frankly, to extinction. Um, the, what you see now in the domesticated cattle is really, really a crossbreed. Uh, it, was, it was made by, it was invented by humans. Um, it's kind of the animal that never was to some degree. Uh, we've we've crossbred a lot of stuff. So we now have this domesticated livestock that we used as a food source. Um, maybe there's something in that. Maybe there's 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 something um, s significant or specific as it relates to that. You know, we, we could go on and on. But frankly, we could spend another two and a half hours just, just speculating on, on why cows. Um, there's a lot of different reasons, reasons why potentially. Um, you know, the fact that it is a a primary food source for a lot of people on this planet. Um, you know, does that have something to do with it? You know, are they, are they, is there something relevant to that, 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 that is of int key interest? Um, I had the privilege of speaking to a veterinarian up here in Montana of all places. And uh, he was a former official uh, and uh, is a veterinarian and uh, is called a lot of times to these cattle mutilations. And he is absolutely 100% convinced that this is, uh, it is something that is not natural uh, and that is being done. Farmers will report lights in the sky. Um, later on, they discover these animals with uh, what appears to be um, cauterization of the wounds, uh, a lot of sexual organs particularly removed, um, and then some really other unique pieces to the puzzle where, um, you know, maybe one tiny bone is missing. Uh, in the entire animal. Uh, and that's it. Uh, like it was just removed for the sake of removing it and studying it. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that's interesting. That's been around for a while. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of people have, uh, you're not the first to ask me that. That's for sure. SR asks, not sure if this has been asked, has Lou ever heard of Zimmer knocked whistleblower, the Zimmer, Zimmer knocked whistleblower called exactly that or under any other name appearing on reddit and if yes is there any truth to it at all well i, I don't read reddit um very often um again if uh if, if i want to abuse myself i'll just get on twitter um hmm. they do a great job doing it i don't need any more 
<laughs> and then second of all, uh, no, Zimmer Nacht, I am not, not aware of. Um, I'm not familiar with that unless there's some sort of vernacular uh, that um, it's, is also referencing that. I, I have no idea about that. Stojin Karlusik asks, what does Lou think of the set of documents named Allies of Humanity? Uh, I've read a lot of documents. I, I don't necessarily know about Allies of Humanity what that is, unless it is uh, something involves different species uh, that have been alleged to exist. I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't know what that is. Matt wants to know what are, this goes back to the worms asking which dirt do humans eat? Yeah. <laughs> that great analogy, by the way. <laughs> so what questions? I eat only the very best dirt. <laughs> what questions should we, as the audience, as myself, perhaps even as you, which questions should we be asking that we aren't? Man, well, you're doing it. This is it. This is exactly why we're having this conversation, right? To figure that out. Um, so you earlier know, when you were saying that we have some unstated assumptions and we have boxes, yeah, you're not saying that you're immune from that. You're saying- No, no, I need your help too, mm -hmm. to, to break out of that. No, I'm not, absolutely I'm not immune to it. No, absolutely not. I have the same bias as everybody else. Right. Um, no, this is something we need to figure out collectively. No, I'm not. This is not a trick question. I'm asking you to say, ha ha, I have the answer. No, no, no. I, I, I'm, I have got the same challenge you do. We're in the same boat. Um, we, we need to figure this out. And, and this is why I say we need academics and scientists and everybody else on board because, and, and philosophers and everybody, because they're the ones that are going to help us figure how to do that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a dude. I'm just one guy. I, I'm, 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 you know, I might not be super dumb, but I'm not necessarily the smartest guy either. I, I don't, I don't have any to all these things. Well, you're extremely bright, man. It's humbling. Oh, no. I appreciate it, but no, I can assure you. you my... <laughs> Speaking about humbling, when you mentioned the word sober and somber, that to me, the reason why is because, not because we're more special than we think we are, but we're much less. So then yeah. I was wondering, hmm, is perhaps another motivation for people that wolf pack around you, not just a financial motivation, not just national security, but also perhaps self-preservation because- Absolutely self-preservation. Okay. Yes, that's a huge part of it. In fact, it also goes to pride and ego and self-preservation. I mean, these are these are innate innate components of, of of the human psyche, and we need to be aware of it. And and a lot of people don't even realize they're that way. Um, you know, it 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 comes from a place of self-preservation, ultimately survival. You know, um, control, um, and to some degree even resources. Um, it's it's almost part of our character. Um, we, I mean, you look at any, any type of society, whether you have a, a society where you have a, a monarchy, a king or a queen making authoritative decisions, or even to some degree presidents or, you know, uh, popes and, you know, and again, I'm not against any of this. I'm just simply saying that we as a species, we always, we always want answers. We always want someone to, to have the final say in narrative because we like, we like our, our, our life to be defined. When you look at the way an average city is, is city organizer, the reason why we make our streets and grids north and south, east and west, because subconsciously it helps us know where we are at any given time. Why we have a compass, right? What time would look even a watch tells us where we are in time, right? We, we, we are a species that doesn't like, we fear the unknown. And when you look at Carl Sagan's pale blue dot for the very first time. And you realize that everything in existence that we know of has occurred on that tiny little pale blue dot, uh, which is, you know, th three pixels large uh, in the vastness and vacuum of space in just one ray of light from the sun. That makes people pretty uncomfortable. You know, uh, the fact that, you know, other than towards the center of the earth, there's no such thing as up or down. There's really no such thing as left. If you go left far enough, you come back right again. Uh, up is relative. You know, up just means I'm moving away from the center of the earth. That's all. There is no real up or down. You know, we don't know if, if, we're, if we're flying sideways somewhere in the Milky Way in the universe or if we're upside down or what. If there is, a, there is no upside down. There's no, there, there, my point is that when you really look at the universe for what it is, um, we have no idea where we are. None. Um, we are spinning in an obscure spiral arm of some obscure galaxy we happen to call the Milky Way. 
that's on a collision course with another galaxy called Andromeda uh, in the next 250 million years or so. Uh, but in reality, we have no idea where the hell we are or where we're going or where we've been. And, and so we, we build these anecdotes and histories and whatnot because it helps us make sense from nonsense. And that's, that's what we like as human beings. We, we don't, that's why when you put people in, a, in, a, in a, a solid white room or even the furniture's white, most people will report not only being disoriented, but being uncomfortable. Uh, because there's no point of, 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 there's no relativity within the relativeness within the, within not relative, rel relativeness within the, within the room. Um, in fact, it, 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 that's why death is, is so scary for so many people because it's the great unknown. Um, and it, it's something that as a species, we, we fear, um, a lot and, and, you know, it's, it's part of, uh, nobody wants to know that they're lost. Nobody, nobody wants to know. That's why safety and security is so important. A lot of, a lot of relationships, right? People would say, I just want, I just want safety and security. That's all. I just want to know that that person's going to be there for me and I can rely upon them, right? They want stability. They want, they want an anchor. Um, and that's not a bad thing. That that's who we are, but we also have to realize there's a lot of things in this universe, you know, that that are going to going to force you to reevaluate and that's really really uncomfortable once you really realize that you are truly we are alone out here in the universe from a from a human perspective right i'm not saying from a living thing or a, 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 you know i'm saying from a human perspective um you know that's scary for a lot of people um uh, you know Best is, to our knowledge, we are the only humans in, in the universe. And of course, we have a bunch of animals we can play with on our little planet that we call Earth and, you know, kind of makes, kind of makes us feel good. But, but it's looking more and more like every single day that there's, there's, there's more out there. Um, it's just not human. And then the question is, okay, well, what are their intentions? What are the motivations? Do they want to work with us or do they want to subjugate us? Um, or are we going to be uh, tomorrow's uh, uh, dinner menu, right? Um, all these things go through the minds of people. And, and they're, 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 you know, they're good questions and, and questions, frankly, we don't have an answer for yet. And that makes people really, really uncomfortable and unsettled. And I think we need to be aware of it. So back to your question, what, you know, am I, am I subject to the same box bias that you are and everybody else? You're damn right. I am. Yeah. And we need to figure out how, how, how to look at this topic, uh, look at a potentially a non-human topic through non-human eyes is what I'm trying to say. Uh, we, we may have to take our glasses, our human glasses off um, that uh -huh. kind of filter. Everything How do we do that in terms? Well, that's my question, right? How do we do that? This is exactly why we're having this conversation. What can people be doing? Having that conversation. Exactly. That's exactly what, what we could be doing. Can I what add to doing. what you said? If you don't mind, like a 30 second yeah. is on point. Hopefully this pale blue dot which I imagine is something I don't know about it. I imagine it's zooming out and seeing how insignificant we are relative. So let me tell you the pale blue dot. There's a couple, there's a couple of pictures that have really, really, if you really want to look at something that's pretty amazing. The first image is called the pale, pale blue dot. Um, Carl Sagan um, as the, I think it was a Voyager, it might've been the pioneer. I think it was a Voyager spacecraft was, was leaving um, earth's orbit. It uh, by, by somewhere around the moon, it turned around and took a picture of the earth. And then as it was billions and billions of miles away, as it was about to leave the, the, um, the solar system, so to speak, it's actually the inner solar system, but it was, but you know, to the best of our knowledge at the time, it was the solar system. This is before the heliosphere and whatnot. Um, the the, he had a great idea. He said, why don't we turn that spacecraft around and take one more picture of earth, see what it looks like. And so he did, and he turned it around and no, he didn't, the NASA turned it around, took a picture of earth. And at first they couldn't find it until one scientist pointed out, what's that? And, and you should look it up on Google. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. Look at it with, with the original photo, not zoomed in. Um, and, and you all of a sudden get this sense of um, vastness. And, and, and most will agree, maybe a little, even a little insecurity because you're like, ooh, that's a, that's a fragile little tiny ball in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and then uh, another picture is uh, taken by, um, it was the lunar orbiter. Uh, it might've been the Apollo 11 mission where they're rendezvousing with the, uh, with the lunar lander. And in there, there's a picture of the lunar lander with 
picture of earth behind it. And in that picture, you realize for the first time that all of humanity, everything that has ever existed, everything that anybody had ever hoped, dreamed, or wished for, every war, every famine, every crisis, every human being that ever lived, an animal and living thing that we knew of was all contained in that one picture, except for one person. And that was the one human being taking that picture from the lunar orbiter. And that's very humbling because then you realize, you know, wow, we really are, are all in this together. And, and, you know, we better for worse, we're, we're, we're family, we're a community. Um, and, um, you know, those are the two pictures. I, I would recommend people take a look at those. They're, 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 for me, that was very impactful. You know, they say a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, in this case, a picture is worth 5 billion people. Um, pretty, pretty interesting. Let me play with that if I can do so for a little bit. And let me see if I can say this. I haven't articulated this out loud. But when people show, there are some YouTube videos that show the vastness of space, how immense it is. Just keep zooming out, zooming in and out, in and out. I mean, out and out and out and outward. And then some people feel dread and meaninglessness. But to me, that that seems like, it seems like a relic of territorial domination when we used to tell a country's power or stature from how much it owned. Because what difference does it make if we're 1% of 1% of 1% spatially or temporally of the galaxy? All of what matters, maybe that's not what matters at all. Maybe space and time being located in it isn't what matters. If it was, then we could go to the Holocaust and say, well, it doesn't matter because look at how small of a region it is and how temporally bounded it was and say, so it doesn't matter. But it matters. Your, the birth of your daughter matters. The, everything that ma the death of your son matters. Every single thing that matters is bounded temporally and spatially. So perhaps what matters most isn't how much space do we take up, but maybe it's our heart. Maybe it's our capacity for pain. Maybe it's the ability to show love despite being hurt and to trust again. Maybe that all in from another realm is something, it's huge. Maybe it's vastly huge in the way that we look at ourselves as small. Maybe it's huge, in to make an analogy, in the realm of consciousness, if it's a space like space and time. But we don't know. And in fact, all that we do know is what matters isn't like your favorite piece of music. It's not, it's only three or four, five, ten minutes long. It's not an infinite amount of time. So I, I well, I Kurt, the I, value of a yeah. human being, again, may not be what's up in here and the body. It may be that, that piece that we talked about before, right? That, that indelible part of the human that, that is hard to define, whether you call it a spirit or whatever you want to call it, you know, a soul, um, you're right. And, and I, I think, I think there's, that, that's the value of a human being. It's not that $2 and three cents worth of carbon that my body's worth. Mm, you know, right, my, right, right. The nine pounds or so of my brain, or maybe in my case, my much less weight, <laughs> you know, but um, it's, it's, it, there's something else that, that creates the value for a human being. But, you know, I, I've said this before, and let me reiterate this for anybody who hasn't heard this yet. You know, we talk about the human being being this small moment of occupying the small moment of space in this infinitely vast, you know, 92 billion light year galaxy, uh, universe across from side to side. And yet, and yet within every single human being, Kurt, is almost an equal amount of space. What do I mean? Well, let's look at an atom one times 10 to the negative 26. When you compare that to the human body, you know, we are that universe. We are that vastness. We are to the atom. We are the universe. And we are just as big. Interesting, interesting, right? And right. so we really sit in the, right in the middle of the scale of the universe. And that's important because it, it, as big as the universe outside is, it's just as big inside. And, and you know, we're just now beginning to explore the realities of that and what that means. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's beauty in that, but of course, for a lot of people, there's a lot of discomfort, right. And uncertainty, right. And insecurity. So, um, so yeah, I get it, man. I, I, I understand it's, it's, um, it's one of those things that, that, you know, we, we ultimately we're wrestling ourselves. Why are we so insecure and why does this topic make us so insecure? Well, because we're forced to look in the mirror and question ourselves.
and, and reconcile the fact that we really don't know where we are and we really don't know where we're going. Despite the best and the brightest in our, in our governments that we appoint and say, yes, we are giving you the, the, uh, the authority to, to, to tell us things, right? But in reality, it's kind of an illusion. Um, it's just like money. The only reason why money means anything is because we've all made a, a moral contract to agree that, yes, it's valued. But it doesn't really have value. It's a piece of paper. There's no real intrinsic value behind it other than we've all agreed to the illusion that, yeah, it means something. Well, it's the same thing with, with governments and authority and some religions, you know, that we, we, we have invested this, this authority to, to tell us as a species, give us answers, give us meaning, right? Uh, so you think and, those at the uh, top feel insecure that they may not have the answers? Oh, well, they, they don't. A lot of them don't have the answers. It's not, they don't feel, I, we know they don't. And, and I think if they were to be true to themselves, they know they don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, look at look at do politicians. Do you think they do? Do you think that they think that they have the answers, or do you feel like they, they know they don't think deep enough to even recognize it? I think they think they have answers for the paradigm from which they are living in. They don't understand that there's a much bigger reality there for their little reality that's been conceived and painted for them. Yes, they're coloring within the boundaries of the of the of the of the lines. It's like me when I take notes in this book. Um, you know, I, 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 I can, I'm confining my notes only to the limit boundaries of the paper, right? That's all I can have to write with. Um, some people are those have notes classified. Paper. You just revealed some class classified. No, <laughs> no, 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 never classified. So screenshot um, that zoom in. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, you know, that's, uh, for me, um, you know, I, I look at it that way. Some people just have a bigger notepad to write notes. Um, you know, but maybe we get to a point where we realize that even that we need a notepad is, is I'm getting very esoteric, but maybe uh, the fact that we're even using a notepad is limiting us. Maybe, like maybe, limitations maybe of the, language. the key here is that, you know, maybe we need to get rid of notepads altogether. It doesn't matter how big of a notepad you have, because, you know, you're, you're never going to be able to contain all the information in, 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 in a notepad. That's one of the claims of Anjali is that we need to get past the limitations of language for whatever reason the aliens have told her this and that we need to start communicating telepathically or realize the limitations of language, just as an aside. Well, I'm not sure you need aliens to tell you that. I think that's, you know, that's, that's something age old man has known for a long time. Uh, you know, that old cliche, right? Well, I love you beyond words. Well, what does that mean? I mean, we're limited by language. You know, language is as close as we can get right now to reading each other's minds. But at the end of the day, we're still limited. You know, but I, I don't. I definitely don't need aliens necessarily to tell me that. That's that's a kind of <laughs> that's kind of a, a reality for us. I think. Okay, getting back to some of these, I know that you're all eager. Kevin Lansdowne asked, given the clues Lou DeLong and others have been laying down, it seems like we're dealing with crypto terrestrials, not necessarily aliens. Is this what Admiral Byrd found during Operation High Jump? It's absolutely possible that this is something that's been on been on this planet for a very long time, and it's just as natural to 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 Earth as we are. Uh, it could very well be its own. You know, this is crazy as it may sound, could be its own animal kingdom. You know, just like the hidden world of of protozoa and whatnot of the microorganisms in that animal kingdom that was invisible to us until just a couple hundred years ago, uh, could be. You know, um, the likelihood of it, I, I don't really know, but it's def. I mean, it is a possibility. You can't, you can't say no. Umix asks, can you ask him about Project Crystal Knight, a.k.a. Project Serpo, which was featured at the end of Steven Spielberg's Close Encounter? Um, I am not familiar enough with it to speak in any type of authoritative way. Um, it'd be pure speculation. So um, just I'll leave it, unfortunately. I wish I could answer it for you. Okay. Matt Wood asks, have you had, you, Lou, have you had any holy shit moments where you learned a truth about something so over the top that it wasn't even on your question list, speaking of question lists? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. let me continue then. So you have more to riff off of. How many times have extraordinary relevations occurred to you as you were learning about this phenomenon? So as it relates to UAP, um, there were a few. I'm 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 beginning to put my thoughts down on paper. Um, there were there were a, there were there were quite a few, um, and um, you know each time it challenged my 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 perspective on things. It, it challenged my my um, 
my understanding of, of the universe and our place in it. Um, but uh, not quite yet prepared to have that conversation. Uh, but but I, I will have it at some point. Did you ever lose sleep over it? All the time. Gus Baja asks, if Lou is under NDA, how can he write a book with new and definitive information regarding the UAP phenomenon? I don't think this question is meant to be snarky at all. I think it's genuine. Yeah, it's, it's got to go through a security review process. And my intent is to put everything I can down there. And then whatever the government decides, uh, no different than, than Lukatsky, whatever the government decides to redact, and you're going to know what's redacted. You're going to know what parts are redacted and what parts are not. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, you got to try it, but it's not my call. I've, I've got to get it reviewed. So, you know, how can I? Well, I, I, I can by going through the right processes and, and that's how you do it. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. So I intend to do it the right, the right way. How long does that process take when you give them a book? Uh, and then you have to me. It can be, can be, can be a while. Um, you know, but that's, that's what I'm going to do. And I've got a great partnership with, with, with Harper Collins, who, who is, 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 you know, willing to take this journey. So, and by the way, there'll be a very specific reason, very obvious when, when that book comes out, a lot of people are, are making uh, presumptions and assumptions of, of, of my motivation. They haven't a clue. They have no clue what I'm doing. It'll be very clear. What will be, be obvious? Be crystal clear of, of why I'm writing this book. I see. When, when it comes out, people are going to go, oh, wow. So. Jesus is the light asks one question for Lou. I've never heard this one asked if UAPs are trying to prevent us from nuclear war that supposedly may happen in the future. Now this is predicated on the future human hypothesis. When was this supposed to take place? Is it less than 10 years from now? Obviously we're in wild yeah. speculative territory. I mean, we don't know they're trying to prevent a nuclear war. That's, that's again, a, a, a presumption by, by some people, you know, let's, Let's not forget that in Russia, they actually turned them on. So that, you know, I don't know if that's preventing a nuclear war. And by the way, if that's the case, they didn't prevent us dropping a, a bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, you know, there's, there's already flawed logic there that they're trying to prevent anything. We don't know that. We are presuming. Um, so we need to be very careful with that. As far as any type of future war, your guess is as good as mine. Um, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's a whole different territory that I'm I'm not, uh, I'm definitely not qualified to answer. Okay. This is a question that I've thought about. Wally Lafferty asks, who are the government people that come to confiscate cameras and data threatening witnesses to remain silent about their experience? This has happened to military and civilian witnesses. He says, a tip question mark. Yeah, no, it wasn't a tip. I mean, no, it wasn't a tip, but, but yeah, there were people who definitely, who definitely, uh, tried to intimidate people and, um, you know, all I got to say is, you know, I, that wouldn't be wise to do it with me and my colleagues. Um, you know, I, I, I don't get intimidated very easily. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of the people who, if, if you poke us, we're going to poke you right back. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know why people got intimidated in the past. Um, you know, the only way I would ever shut up from this is if someone really came in and said, Lou, we need you to, to be quiet. This is hurting national security. But that hasn't happened. Um, you know, I'm the kind of guy, if you try to intimidate me, you're, 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 you're making a big, big mistake. Um, and I'm, I'll leave it at that because my background is, is specific enough where um, you better come at me with everything you got. Is there any truth to men in black? Well, I mean, sure. The question is, who are they? You know, there's been elements in the past where, you know, U.S. investigators um, I mean, the truth is we wear black suits sometimes. I mean, I have three of them, you know, um, it, the problem is that Hollywood is kind of portrayed it a certain way. Um, you know, for, for us, you know, black suits were, were fairly functional. You could, you could look, I mean, this is going to sound silly, but you know, you wear them because they're like wearing jeans, but formal attire because you can sp spill food on black suits and all that kind of stuff and kind of wipe it away. And, you know, it's a little bit more forgiving than, than, a, than another type of suit. Um, so, and, and historically they tend to be more of the cheaper suits um, just because they're black. They're not, you know, really fancy material or stuff like that. So historically black suits have always been synonymous with government and, and, you know, what people refer to us as government stiffs. Um, there's always been 
men in black. You know, I, I, I was one of them. I was a counterintelligence special agent, but I never intimidated, intimidated people like that. Um, and so the question is, who, who's doing that? And, and, and why are they doing that? And under whose authority are they doing that? That's my problem. You know, if, if they're operating with without any authority, then, you know, you got problems, you know, because, you know, we had to all operate under under rules and authorities. And if you're not and you're running rogue and you're going around intimidating people, you know, I, I can't stand bullies, man. I, I, I'm, I don't like bullies. I'm not that guy. Um, anybody who knows about the way I was raised and, and what I had to go through. You know, I'm, I'm, I tend to be a bit of an anti-bully. Um, I, I tend to try to <laughs> bully the bullies. This, yeah, you know, that's 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 kind of or put the bullies of, in their place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, they weren't going to be bullies much longer. I can assure you. Um, so, anyways, with that said, uh, Kurt, unfortunately, I'm getting blown up here. Um, to I guess I'm late by six minutes uh, for another interview i hate to be um hey i'd love to keep talking about this yeah, i had a no fantastic problem, time with your your folks um hopefully i didn't waste anybody's time i know you're gonna get people saying oh lou didn't answer my question and oh lou avoided this and that i'm sorry in advance they're gonna do it they've got some haters they're just gonna they're gonna nail you on it uh but you know i'd love to do this again with you and if there's anything i haven't addressed you know let's 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 do it next time thank you man i appreciate your generosity again immense generosity and as well as for what you're doing well and i appreciate what you're doing and i appreciate what your audience is doing because you guys are making the difference you know you keep asking me what can you do you're doing it this is exactly what you can do and so you're doing it better than anybody else so so thank you take care man you got it take care folks and i'm sorry i had to leave like this but uh i uh, I do have another another no problem no problem i apologize (laughs) okay take care everybody till next time yes sir take care Okay, now let me take a look at the comments. Um, thank you all. You all are saying thank you so frequently. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Easter. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Pix. Thank you, Fetus or Festus. Krusty, thank you. Let me think if there are, are announcements. There's an audio version of the podcast. So there's iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Pandora, and so on. If you check the links in the description of any of the videos, if you are interested in supporting this podcast, just so you know, the patrons and the sponsors are the only ones that are what allow me to do this full time. So if you would like to, then you're more than welcome to go to patreon.com slash Kurt The link to all of that is it's in virtually every video. So you can click the description there and support even a dollar there are custom pledges. People want to know. Some people want to donate more. Some people want to donate less. And there is a way to custom pledge if you're if you want to. There is no incentive for the patrons, and I'd like to keep it that way. What I mean by that is that you don't get a cup. You don't get. Oh, by the way, speaking of merch, there's toe merch. I'm going to talk about that. You don't get a cup. You don't get access to episodes sooner or ad free. You are simply doing so to support the channel and show your love. So if you would like to do that, again, that's patreon.com slash Kurt Jaimungle, C-U-R-T-J-A-I-M-U-N-G-A-L. And there's no thank you regardless. Okay, as for the merch, there's toe merch for the first time. Theories of Everything merch, and that's until the end of October. I'll include the link right here if you're interested. Until the end of October 2021, there's the first ever Theories of Everything merch at the link in the description, or you can visit tinyurl.com slash toe merch, T-O-E-M-E-R-C-H. Dylan, you asked if I could ask your super chat next time. I will remember your name, Dylan808. You need toe socks merch. There are, there is Kirk, Kirk House, there is toe socks merch. So there's two types of toe socks, one that says toe and then one that says toe clippings. In case you don't want to watch two hours, three hour, four hour, five hour long conversations, some of our podcasts, the longest seven hours. If you don't want to watch that, which many people don't have the time. In fact, they feel a sense of consternation looking at the length of the podcast. There, there's a channel called toe clippings, which has anywhere from one to 10 minutes clips. When when will Lou be back on? That's when Lou decides to be back on. I'll have him on virtually anytime he'd like to come on. Okay, so I should get going. I'm fairly tired. And 
those who are sticking around are sticking around maybe because they are interested in the behind the scenes of the channel. So if you are, here's a little behind the scenes. I I plan on still going at it full force and I don't mind if I burn myself out, which it's seeming more and more likely as each day that goes by because on November 2nd or so, I'm pretty much taking a month or two months off, perhaps starting November 3rd. So I'm going to go at it full force. The next round of podcasts, I have the list here. They are Luis Alessandro. I will likely be doing an AMA on Sunday, so you can watch that live. Michael Levin is also coming out. Carlo Rovelli, which is a theoretical physicist. Stefan Alexander, another theoretical physicist. And then I am being interviewed on several platforms like UFO Singularity Podcast. Greg Henriques has a podcast called Universal Theory of Knowledge, I believe. So I'll be on that. Garrett Vanderberg, Vandenberg has a podcast, so I'll be out on that. So quite a bit happening. And then someone fairly large, which I'm not allowed to announce, I'll be on his or her podcast. And so preparing for that is quite daunting. Someone, Matt, do you want to know if any of the questions were screened by Lou? None. I don't think a single one. I think there was one question I was going to send him and ask him, is it okay if I ask you this? But that was my question, and I didn't end up doing so. Lastly, I said that I would read aloud all the super chats. However, there are far too many to read, and so what I'll do instead is place a link in the description to a Reddit thread where I've copied and pasted each of the super chats. Next time that I speak with Lou, these will get priority. The podcast is now finished. If you'd like to support conversations like this, then do consider going to patreon.com slash C-U-R-T J-A-I-M-U-N-G-A-L. That is Kurt Jaimungal. It's support from the patrons and from the sponsors that allow me to do this full-time. Every dollar helps tremendously. Thank you.